Hey guys, this is Frank Yetter, and you're listening to Submission Radio. Hey, this is Rich Franklin. What's up, everybody? This is Chris Lieben. This is Diego Sanchez. Randy Couture. Alice Overing. Hi, this is Stephen Bonner. This is Don Fry. Hey, I'm Phil, Mr. Wonderful Davis. TJ Dillashaw. And you're listening to Submission Radio. Submission Radio. Submission Radio. Submission Radio. You're listening to Submission Radio. Welcome to another episode of Submission Radio, episode 152. It's Wednesday, the 14th of March, on a cloudy day here out of Melbourne, Australia. Dennis Crowder here with Casper Ozlowski. Two Submission Radio episodes back to back, Cas. This is unheard of. <laughs> yes, this is this is a new precedent we're setting in 2018. <laughs> People are going wild, and I'm glad you mentioned the weather because you're right. It's kind of a bit of a crappy day. I'm hearing it's going to be 30 degrees. I was hoping to maybe do a bit of tanning, but then I saw the clouds and I thought. You sons of bitches, you get out of my city. But uh, <laughs> hopefully Smish Radio brings a couple of rays of sunshine into your life, straight through the ear holes, and uh, that's what we plan to do. Hopefully a bit of fun. we got some cheeky, sexy, spicy guests on the show. Making his debut on the show, Dan Hooker, actually. I can't believe this show's been going for like a thousand years. I think it's been four. <laughs> actually, it's going to be four next week. How about that? I just realized time flies. Anniversary's coming up. It's going to be four years next week, and Dan Hooker has never been on the show. So finally, we're putting an end to that. He's, he's, he's on the show this week. I'm happy to announce that. Uh, there's a lot to talk about there. He's obviously got a fight coming up. I mean, he's just, he's a fun guy. He's got this crazy Isuzu ute, the Dan Hooker mobile. So there's a lot to talk to him about. Uh, Tyson, Pedra, and Ty Tuavasa, the hot young things on the block at light heavyweight and heavyweight, are joining us on the program. And of course, when you have one, you have to have the other. That's just the way it comes. It's it's a it's a two for one combo, and I was super excited to talk to them. Uh, Mark Ramondi. I mean, this is a a bit of a quiet week in MMA. Some happenings, but nothing huge. No massive events. We decided let's get our good friend Mark Ramondi back on the program. It's been a while. I think maybe a year or two since we've last had him on the program. We thought, let's discuss some things a little bit outside the box. Dennis, you had a great idea, great concept. We want to chat to him about the MMA JA, the MMA Journalist Association, some of the behinds of the scenes happenings of an MMA journalist and things in MMA fighting, and uh, and just wrap and just get Mark's thoughts on a couple of things to do with the MMA world. Uh, Curtis Blades is making his official submission radio debut. The man is taking on Alistair Overeem a UFC 225 in Chicago. Chicago. I'm curious if he thinks that this is going to get him the next title shot because I'll tell you what, it probably will and he'll probably be deserving of it. So I think people are sleeping on this fight, but we're going to be speaking to the man. And of course, Owen Roddy returns to the program. Of course, the striking coach at SBG Island and SBG Charlestown, Dublin. He has his own gym. Of course, he trains guys at Art Lobo, Conor McGregor, Chris Fields, and many, many others. And Hey man, there's always stuff to discuss with the guys at SBG and of course a lot to discuss regarding Conor McGregor, so that's going to be a juicy one. Can't wait to chat to him and uh, it's looking like a sexy show, isn't it Dennis? That's right. It looks like the clouds are clearing up. A good guest lineup and a lot of fun to talk about. And just quickly, before we jump to the first guest and get into this action-packed program, uh, follow us on Twitter, at Submission AOS, if you guys haven't followed us yet. There's a lot of fun stuff that happens on Twitter that you miss out on. If you don't follow us, there's some jokes, there's some gifts. We share our thoughts on a whole bunch of stuff. It doesn't have to be MMA-related. It can be life-related. You know, mm. you never know what's going to happen on the Submission Radio Twitter, so make sure to follow us. We also have our messages open, so you can message us your thoughts on the episode we love chatting to you guys so make sure to do it also facebook facebook.com forward slash submission radio au hey, you can like the page there's some fun videos that happen there we're trying to sort of scour the internet for some fun stuff that's happening so maybe some some fake martial arts or some crazy <laughs> fight outcomes and then also of course we do report a lot of the stuff that's coming to the channel on there you guys may miss out on it if you're only subscribed on itunes but if you are subscribed on itunes sexy transition <laughs> well, how about a nice review? We love a good review. We read them. We enjoy them. And uh, we read out the sexiest, spiciest reviews on the program. Me and Casper do that ourselves. So if you do appreciate the show, jump on, give us a review. Let us know what you think. It all means a lot to us. We love chatting to you guys. We're all just fans in this thing together, just trying to deliver a bit of fun on a weekly basis. So if you're driving to work, about to kick off your gym workout, about to bury a body in a, in a vacant woods in the middle of Atlanta... <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, we're happy to be in your voices as you do it. Caspi mentioned it's going to be a huge lineup. We have our first guest on the line, and you're about to introduce him. 
All right, guys. This next man's submission radio debut has been a long time coming. One of the biggest names to come out of New Zealand. He's on a two-fight win streak, and he continues his legend killer tour when he takes on the super tough Jim Miller at UFC Fight Night 128 on April 21st in the States for the first time ever on submission radio. Dan, the hangman hooker, welcome to the program, man. How are you? Yeah, good. I just finished up training. Well, we're happy to have you on the program. It's been a long time coming. It's exciting times in the life of Dan Hooker. We see the Isuzu Dan Hooker mobile is back in action on the streets of Auckland. Tell us, what's it like driving that bad boy around? We imagine you're getting stopped at every red light around town. Oh, no, Kiwis aren't, Kiwis aren't that bad. I get a, get a few looks and a few toots. But it's, uh, <laughs> more, more people I know uh, singing out to me. But yeah, I'm a, I'm a hard man to miss driving around Auckland. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the Isuzu's there. It's 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 uh it's making a statement. Where's the strangest place you've taken that bad boy? We we imagine it would go off at weddings and nights out of the pub and other places. <laughs> oh, I got actually a funny story. I was having a, a meeting with one of my sponsors, mm. and they they actually happened to be next door to an adult store. <laughs> I love this and story so already. I, I, yeah, well, I parked it. I parked it around the corner, just underneath the sign for the adult store, <laughs> and then walked down, met my uh, met my sponsor, finished up, and by the time I finished, I had people paste, had posted pictures of my car underneath <laughs> the adult store, going, "Dan, what are you doing here, mate?" <laughs> Did you stop off at the adult store, like just in case? I mean, you know, you're in the area, people are posting pictures. You gotta, you know, make the story true, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there wasn't too much truth to that one there. <laughs> I feel I feel like the adult store would have been a great sponsor for you. I mean, yeah. they would have seen the amount of photo the times people shared the photos. Did they approach you about maybe doing hey, a product if, under your name? The, the Dan Hooker they, or something? If they bring the dollars to the table, maybe we can talk. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what. Uh, lo- love making will never be the same in New Zealand if that comes together. Um, <laughs> the interesting <laughs> The interesting thing is, while many of our listeners overseas may not know that much about you, you've kind of been one of the biggest names in New Zealand MMA for a really long time now. I mean, what's it like repping New Zealand in the UFC for a while now? What's it like to kind of be scheduled to do it for the first time ever in your career in Las Vegas? Yeah, uh, I guess it was a big moment. Like it, uh, it was definitely one that I wanted to tick off the list. You know, fighting T-Mobile Arena in Las Vegas, you you hear about it. Uh, for your entire career, but at the time you're kind of just focused on the task, so you don't really soak in the moment so much. But no, I'm definitely glad I got that one uh, ticked off, and, and it was a good result. Mm-hmm. Jim Miller, you know, he's a bit of a legend. Were you a big fan of him before you got into the UFC? And you know, is there a fight of his that kind of stands out to you? Yeah, I've been, you know, Jim Miller's been a big name since I first started, you know, watching UFC. Uh, I think this fight will tie him uh, with Michael Bisping for the most UFC fights of all time. I think he's on wow. 28, and then our fight will make him 29th. So that'll tie him for the most UFC fights ever. So, you know, there's a lot of guys going around uh, calling themselves UFC veterans after a couple of fights, but Jim Miller's about as veteran as you come. So mm. this is this is a fight. You know, I relish a, a name like that. I love, I love it when you... When you get that name, and you know it's someone you someone you look up to, or someone you uh, you know you recognize their name, and you think back to all the fights you've seen them have, all the wars. So yeah, I like seeing you know the the posters up there with our names uh, squared off against each other. Mm. Because when you were getting into the sport, you know, in two thousand around two thousand and nine, do you remember a time we uh, were watching Jim fight some of the fights that he was having? And is it surreal to sort of think you, you've gone from that point to actually fighting him in the UFC? Yeah, well, when, I, when I first got into the UFC, I wasn't actually... Oh, I mean, when I first got into MMA, I wasn't actually uh, a big follower of the sport. I didn't really watch fights. I didn't even think for the first six months of training like I'd even seen a UFC show. Wow. <laughs> you know, I, I, I just wanted to fight. I, I went and saw a friend fight locally. And that that got me into the sport. I, you know, that's my my introduction to the sport. And from there, uh, yeah, I just focused on training and, and more the practical approach. 
and I wasn't a big fan of watching fights until, you know, a few years into my career. But, you know, Jim Miller's, I've, you know, I've seen many, many of his fights. Like, he's fought, you know, everyone. He's fought Nate Diaz. He's fought, you know, he's fought everyone in the lightweight division. You go top to bottom on the top 15, and it's it's hard to find a name he hasn't competed against. Yeah, for sure. Be- because you sort of, you know, originally, because that's sort of the way you enter the sport, you weren't big on watching fights and you're know, sort of following the sport. Are you big on watching tape and studying tape of your opponents? Or have you sort of kept that mentality, you know, into training camp where you don't really watch too much on your opponent because you want to focus on yourself? No, nah, that's, so that's definitely changed. Like, uh, I think film studies a very important part of uh, this le- at this level of the sport, uh, you know, it would be kind of foolish to neglect this aspect when there's so much tape and there's, you know, you can you can pick up your opponent's habits and tendencies, their strengths, weaknesses. I think it's a bit ignorant that people say that they don't watch film. I'm, I'm not sure whether they're, you know, whether they're lying or, or something like that, but I feel like it's ignorant. I feel like you, at this level of the sport, you have to watch film. Or, yeah, it's just foolish not to. Mm. Let's go back to another one of your fights with a legend. You put Ross Pearson away in, in a devastating fashion. Tell us a little bit about what that did for your confidence because we remember that fight like it was yesterday. It was, it was a brutal finish. That was sort of the beginning of this two-fight win streak. Did it sort of change something for you once you got that finish? Um, not so much for myself. Like I, I've always known what I was capable of and you know that that performance kind of just showed everyone else and gave a bit of uh everyone else a bit of belief you know I'll, i've always known what i'm capable of in there and then that's just i feel like that's just a, a you know a small glimpse i've got you know so many more ways that that i have knocked people out and how i finish people and and i just can't wait to get back in there and show more yeah for sure um I was going to say, like, you know, you put away Ross Pearson. He's a legend. Jim Miller, he's another legend. What do you think about potentially donning the legend killer nickname? Because you, you kind of, you know, you're putting these legends <laughs> away. You're like a young Randy Orton. Do you like the sound of that? I mean, I'm not saying you to replace the hangman, but, you know, you know, on the side of the legend killer. The legend killer. Uh, that, that's a good, that's a good, uh, that's a good name to have. Uh, who's, who's a legend after this fight that we can, that we can plan out? I'm running nice. out of legends. Well, I feel like there's there's a lot of legends there. We'll, we'll just have to line <laughs> one up, one up after another. No one's safe, and I mean, that is the thing with New Zealand MMA. It seems like there's a lot of real, really good talent coming out of the scene, and you know, you're sort of at the forefront of it. Recently, your teammate and friend Israel Adesanya made his debut and made a great impression on the MMA world as well at the pay per view in Perth. I'm just wondering, I know how close you are to him. What was your reaction to that and the massive hype that he's already gotten all over the world after his fight? Yeah, oh, that kid's a killer, man. This is this has been a long time coming. Uh I've known I've known this for a long time what that what he's capable of. Uh many more performances like that to come. And uh I think the bigger names, I don't I don't see the performances changing at all. I think he can do that. I think he can do it that to uh, you know the top echelon you guys seem pretty chummy how did you guys first meet uh just at uh when i first started training a city kickboxing uh i met him through a friend of ours jamie vanderkill who's uh passed away now so he he introduced the two of us and that's how we uh got to know each other but we 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 call each other more we're frenemies. We're friends and enemies. <laughs> I mean, he, he is an unbelievable striker, but having guys like that in the gym, these great guys that you work with, I mean, iron sharp, sharpens iron. What's it like sort of working with them? And I believe, with you having so many fights in the UFC, did you almost sort of prepare him for what was to come from a, from being in the octagon and the media duties and, and, you know, the people starting to flock to him locally once he sort of made his debut? Did you sort of prepare him for that? from your own experiences? Uh, you know, I, I help out where I can, but I'm just a small part of his training. You know, I've only been training with Israel the last uh, full time, you know, the last uh, two years. It's more our coach, Eugene Beerman, you know, he's kind of been guiding him his entire career, but Israel is a special character in that he he's pre- been preparing 
for this mentally his his entire career. This is this is always where he saw himself getting. Uh, you know, he he's going for for he's going for big things, and he's he's prepared himself mentally for that like a long time ago. It's funny, like people, oh, is he changed now that he's in? No, he's, he's exactly the same guy. He's mm-hmm. just going to have more eyes on him now. Mm-hmm. And well, cool, just quickly, your thoughts on the good cunt T-shirt? Fan, are you a fan of this? Have you have you been have you been wearing this bad boy around town as well? Heck no. <laughs> Why not? Why not? Because uh, I'm more afraid of my mom than anything. <laughs> hey, she'll, she'll smack my ears off if she ever caught me wearing that, mate. <laughs> Well, let's let's go back to uh, 2014 because I almost feel like this fight with Jim Miller kind of reminds me a little bit of the loss that you had against Yair Rodriguez. Obviously, it was a decision loss at UFC 192. It was tough losing to a guy like Yair because it was one of those turning points where people wanted to see whoever was going to win that fight was going to go on to sort of go go on and do great things in the division. I just want to go back to that. I mean, it was a tough fight. It was it was a tough situation losing that fight. But when you saw Yair to go on to have a massive prospect, to be a massive prospect in the division, go on to have these massive uh, headlining fights, what was your reaction? What kind of effect did it have sort of losing that fight for you? Ah, oh, piss. I was just piss. Uh, featherweight shit, that cut shit. I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> No, like you just get, you know, you're going out there, and I was just, you know, depleted version of myself. So, oh, I can't even go back and watch a film because I'm looking at the guy, and that's that's just not me, and that's just something that I had to correct and and kind of move on from. But yeah, oh, you going up and seeing like that, like I want that spot, you know, I want. I want those big fights. I want those, yeah, I want those positions. So it kind of just pisses you off. You know, being pissed off is not always a bad thing. Like, it's a it's a very good motivator to uh, stick with it and get to where you think you, you know, deserve to be and, and warrant being. Mm. And the reason why I brought that up was, I guess that was a big pivotal moment in your career. And I feel like this fight with Jim Miller is sort of, you've worked yourself back up to this moment again. So I'm just wondering... Finding a guy like Jim Jim Miller and this fight really being, I suppose, the next step to sort of pushing you up up in the ladder and giving you all those big fights. Is there any extra pressure for you going into this fight? Is there any sort of ex any any kind of extra pressure on your shoulders going in that you felt sort of preparing for this one? Yeah, pressure's a funny thing. Uh it's self imposed. Uh it's good to it's good to have pressure. You know, pressure will get you motivated. Pressure will will get you in the gym Pro- pressure will pro- help you prepare well you know if you if you're not feeling that pressure during training camp then uh you're not going to have the same motivation to train that hard and uh put in put in that extra work that needs that needs to happen but as the as the fight draws closer i feel uh less pressure if i feel like the hard work is being done in training camp so if i've you know, done all those hard rounds and, and all that extra conditioning work and I feel fit with game plan well, then I'm then I kinda the pressure kinda fades away. I can't imagine uh not having put in all that work, not having put in those hard rounds. Uh then I probably would feel pressure but I I kinda the closer I get to the fight, the less pressure I have as opposed to uh the reverse effect. Yeah, for sure. That that makes a lot of sense. Just quickly one more thing on featherweight you, the crazy thing is you mentioned how you know shit that cut was and how crap you felt and how depleted you were. How come you stayed at featherweight for so long? Because you fought, you know, other than the last couple of fights, you fought the, almost your entire UFC career at featherweight. How come you stayed there for so long? Uh, <laughs> well, the thing is, I, I never make the same mistake twice. I make it five times just to be sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And I'm sure now it would take a million dollars to get me back down to featherweight. No way. So you're saying there's a chance. Well, at least at least we know your price now. <laughs> but were, were there any moments while you were at featherweight where you where you were kind of like, man, this is not good. Like I need to move up before you actually made that move. And and what was sort of I guess keeping yeah, you well, at featherweight? Well, they kind of they they kind of messed us up a bit. You know, like when I was first. Uh, cutting down like the IVs or legal. I used to use the IVs to rehydrate and that would get me up 
uh, that would get me up a lot bigger. And so it was the Yaya fight was the first fight where they banned IVs. So mm. that's the first time in my life that I'd ever made featherweight uh, without rehydrating intravenously. And we made, yeah, I didn't do some, I didn't do some things right, like small adjustments that we kind of made, but yeah, I was just not that honest with myself. Like uh, I'll wake up on fight day and I'm, I'm telling myself, I feel, you know, I feel amazing. I feel like a million bucks. And that's just uh, having your mind actually overpower your body. I think, you know, I'm very strong mentally. So I was able to kind of tell myself that I, I felt good and I'd convince myself that my body felt good when really it didn't. And I didn't actually notice the massive effect that it was having on me and the toll it was taking on me physically in training and from the cut and, you know, depleting me until I moved back to lightweight. And I kind of, it, it was about two weeks of me putting back and getting back to my normal size. And I was just like, ah, uh, yeah, no, nah, this was a, this has been a shit idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get back to Jim Miller because he's super tough. He's dangerous. He's willing to go toe to toe and he's crafty on the ground. How, how are you approaching the Jim Miller puzzle as you game plan for this thing? Yeah. Uh, uh, Jim Miller's a very interesting fight in that he has, uh, so much film and he's, you know, he's consistently uh, shows his game. So we kind of, it's kind of, you know what to expect, but he does uh, stifle a lot of guys. You know, he, he's south poor. He'll, he'll get underneath you with those shots and he's uh, top pressure. So I can see where, where he'll be planning to take the fight, you know, get underneath me, close the range, put me on my back and kind of uh, doesn't really posture up, but he'll, he'll be looking for me to kind of panic, tire up, and kind of wear me down. So I know what he's bringing to the table. So it's kind of like, what adjustments can I make to my game to stop that? And not only stop that, but I, I'll, I want to put Jim Miller away. Like that's really what I'm coming out to do at the end of the day. So yeah, keep the fight on the feet, keep it at range and uh, catch him coming in. I think so the main focus. And we know you're planning to take over in 2018. We know this is your year. So tell, to tell us, if this does go to plan, you mentioned fighting possibly other legends before, but what is the next step? If everything goes well against Jim, will you be looking for a quick turnaround? Are you looking to have many, many fights this year? What's your plan for 2018 if things go to plan? I think, uh, well, I'm going to get this fight done. Uh, all goes well. Get past Jim Miller. Get another win, uh, sit back, open my gym up. I'm opening a gym in Auckland, my own uh, my own gym, and uh, wait for the next name to come through. And I better have a little number next to the name. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll be I'll be sitting back waiting for a, uh, a ranked opponent. I think I think I deserve it. Well, I definitely deserve it. So I'll be definitely waiting for a ranked opponent after this. Just quickly, I mean, obviously, you're working your way to the rankings, but, you know, we'd be silly not to ask you what you actually think of the division. There's a massive fight coming up with Tony Ferguson and Khabib Nurmagomedov. We know Conor McGregor's sort of kind of in the mix. He, he may defend it or he may fight one of the guys for the title, depending who wins. There's a lot of talent in the top 15. What do, what do you make of lightweight, the way that it looks today and sort of the stuff that's happening right now? Uh yeah, it's a bit unclear, you know, a real uh, path to the title. You know, uh, lightweight is the most, uh, it's got the most amount of fighters of any division. So to have them without a clear path to the, you know, there's a lot of kind of wasted space in that top 15 with guys sitting out and, and uh, choosing their battles. But I think when this Khabib Tony fight goes down and then one of them becomes the real champion they they you know it'll bring a lot of clarity to the division and and we'll have an, another contender and there'll be a real path to the title after this fight so it's a big fight for the lightweight division to to you know kind of restore order back to lightweight who do you think wins that one oh man that's a crazy interesting matchup yeah um i think i think maybe can be can hold him down uh, yeah, I think 
Ferguson's just a little too comfortable off of his back and going to his back. But yeah, those five rounders, I don't know if Khabib's, uh, you know, he uses a lot of energy to hold guys on the ground. Uh, Tony's very, very relaxed. And he's a hard guy to put away. So maybe in the later rounds, I think Tony comes back. But it's a, it's a coin flip, that one. That's a tough fight. And I guess the other good thing about the division is a lot of big names so, sort of towards the bottom. We saw Dariush had a loss recently. You guys, you have veterans like Dunham who could be added to the legend killer list. Anthony Pettis is fighting fighting Chiesa, but you never know what's going to happen. And if he loses, he'll drop even lower. Is it sort of exciting for you to know that if you do get past Jim Miller, there's some big names down the very bottom of that list with some numbers next to them? Oh, yeah, for sure. No, there's a... There's a crazy list of guys and, you know, everyone in the top kind of 30, 40, even 50, like I, I know all of those guys, I've seen them fight, like I recognize their names. So when you're looking like I'm familiar with the top 50, you know, so anyone I get, I know it's going to be a tough matchup. Uh, lightweight's a very tough division, but there's no other division that, you know, I'd prefer to be at. If I'm going to be the champ, I'd, I'd prefer to be the champ at the hardest division. And, uh, you know, so so I know I, I truly earned it. All right, Dan. Well, we could chat to you all day, but uh, we'll let you go. We'll end on this note. You said that you were looking to take Jim Miller out. What, what is the official prediction? How do you see yourself winning at UFC Fight Night 128 in Atlantic City against Jim Miller? Uh, he's a tough guy. He's a tough guy to put away. Mm. Uh, i got a lot of respect for Jim Miller. Mm, maybe to the body, I think. He's got no neck. He's got no head. He's very hard to put away. Maybe, maybe to the body. Somebody. It worked body for Cerrone. Works. Do you think it'll be sort of similar situation like that? Yeah, well, it's kind of the only weakness. I don't. I don't even think I'm going to waste my time trying to look for his neck and choke him out. He's got no neck. He's a <laughs> walking head. He's a walking head. Uh, it's very hard to find the neck. So if I can't get the head, then you know the the body's the next best thing. Well, guys, make sure to follow Dan on Facebook at Dan Hangman Hooker, of course, on Twitter at Dan the Hangman and Instagram Dan Hangman. Also, don't forget to jump on Engage Ind.com. Check out the latest clothing apparel. There's always some Dan Hooker t shirts. Dan, will there be a t shirt coming out before your fight and people can grab? Yeah, I think we're gonna uh, we're gonna put one together with Engage. Okay, cool. So, guys, jump on Engage. Make sure to grab it. Make sure to support Dan. And if you see his Isuzu at the front of an adult shop, don't <laughs> come to any conclusions. He's just meeting with sponsors, everybody. <laughs> Dan, thanks for coming on to Submission Radio. It's a real pleasure having you. Uh, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. This is Chael Sonnen, and you are listening to Submission Radio. All right, guys. Our next guest had a great night at the office at UFC 221 in Perth, getting highlight reel wins when they're not taking names in the octagon. They're hosting their own show, the Half Cast Podcast. It's a pleasure to welcome back Tyson Pedro and Ty Tuivasa at the same time back to Submission Radio after a well-deserved holiday. Boys, welcome back to the program. How are we? Very good. Thank you for having us. Good to be back. Thanks for having us. Well, Ty, first things first, did you end up hearing anything about, about why there was no performance bonus for UFC Perth? Because we put out a compilation <laughs> we're trying to find out for you, but have you heard anything? Nah, just uh, uh, didn't get no money in the bank, so <laughs> too bad, my fault. Did you, have, are you still chasing McMaynard? Is there still a hit on McMaynard at the moment? Just to let him know. <laughs> nah, not anymore. Took it off. <laughs> He, he, said, he said it was. He said it was higher than him. So <laughs> maybe next time. Well, the the other big over his head. Yeah, main main it's off the hook. The other big thing, Tyson, for you, we saw Joe Rogan gave you an open invitation to his show. What was your reaction when you found that out? Uh I'm I'm pumped. I knew I was always going to be on there eventually. Like, oh, that's that's one of my goals. But I've got some more stuff to do before I get on there. So it'll be a little bit. What do What do you mean? What what, what, do, you, what do you have to do? I've got some more stuff to do in my life. I feel like I'm only like at chapter one before I get on there. I've got high expectations of people who go on uh, Joe Rogan's podcast, so I don't think I'm uh, ready to get on there yet. But don't you think this is? And let me ask you about this: the open invitation. Do you think it, do you think it extends to Ty as well? Because I feel like this could be a good introduction for the world to to learn more about the Half Cast podcast and what you guys are all about. One hundred percent. That was already, we've already spoken about this. That was my plan. I wanted to get a, a, both of us over there and do like a 
simultaneously running half-cast podcast episodes. So uh, that's the same as with Brandon Shaw. Hopefully we'll be able to do that, and maybe even the Fighter and Kid, whatever show. It's uh, There's a bunch of opportunities there. I think I think you even even though you know you're obviously young and you feel like you bit you know maybe don't have the experience I think it'd be great sort of like you know chapter one you go on there you do a bit on the Joe Rogan experience and then maybe you come back in the future but Ty do you think there's a chance maybe you could uh, convince Joe Rogan to do a shoey live on the show? I'd hope so. Um, I'll do anything uh, he asks. Well, I hope he asks me to do something, but um, <laughs> I'm sure. Sure, he's done a few things worse than Shuey's. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, um, <laughs> this would, this would be easy for him. How do you think you'd approach him about uh, about convincing him to do a shoey? It'll be on the cards. <laughs> How would you pitch it to him? Just take my shoe off and give him a drink, I suppose. <laughs> so it'd be it'd be <laughs> your it shoe. It wouldn't be like a, a, a new spot. shoe that you'd bring in just for. It'd be your shoe. No, not allowed to sure bring in new shoes. Port. What's that? <laughs> yeah, gotta be the one on the port. Might as well just give him a glass. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. right. <laughs> what What do you think you'd pour in, in into the shoe for him? What What would you have him uh, taste? Oh, it's a Everything bit, it's a mixture. You know, do you know oh. everyone's like everyone's carrying on about like Ty doing the shoey? How did it? That was a good one for Ty. That was like a clean one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <That was> <laughs> like everyone was surprised the about the shoey. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see people were people gave you a new nickname, Ty? They were saying Ty Shui Vasa. What do you think about that one? That's pretty funny. Yeah, it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty funny. <laughs> Love and, a good pun. And we see Ty. We see there's a lot of kids on Instagram now doing shoeys in your honor. What's the best shoey that you've sort of seen in the meantime? And have you had any parents sort of approach you with complaints of someone contacting a bacterial disease in your honor? I've actually had parents send me shoeys of um, their kids doing it with water. So, <laughs> pretty funny. <laughs> it's like it's like it's like there's shoeys and then there's a shoey junior. You just you you do it with water yeah. when you when you're starting out. Yeah. <laughs> if there was like is there was like shoeys? Yeah, if there was shoeys yeah. in the Olympics, you you you'd do the trials like with water and then you you build up to the real thing. <laughs> Ty, what's the current yeah. situation with with Rock? Or oh, sorry, Tyson, what's the current situation with Rock? Are you any closer to having him, you know, on on the podcast? Uh, we've, got, we've got a the Rock. Oh, we've, the we've Rock. got a line that we're gonna like attack. Uh, if, I was like, talking uh, to him yesterday. Probably... No, <laughs> no, no, yesterday. Uh, wait, to the really? Rock. <laughs> yeah, he's come on, in, um, don't let don't let him fall. <laughs> Are you talking about the rock at the local grocery store? Just the guy that hangs out at the front asking for change? Yeah. Is that the rock that you're talking about? <laughs> wow. No, but uh, Tyson, you said there's a line, there's a chance, there's a, there's, a, there's a strategy to approach him now. Yeah, yeah. We, def- we definitely have uh, lined up a strategy uh, that we think uh, might get him on there. So we've got a couple of other guys that we wanted to get on there. Unfortunately, we had a backlog of episodes that were supposed to... Uh, be playing while we we're on holidays, and uh, we came home to find out that they were missing. So, <laughs> uh, we're, we're having Wait, to you, re- recorded, we're reco- you recorded a bunch of episodes, and now you guys can't find them. Well, we can't find this. No, yeah, it was, <laughs> it was, it was a long story, but yeah, yeah, we understand cool. it because cool, it happens to uh, us all the time. Difficulties. <laughs> so, so what, what kind of the, guests? The, yeah. What kind of guests did uh, did the potential half cast podcast? Uh, fans miss out on any big guests? Uh, yeah, the ones that we told you about just before we left: Connie Harrell with Andrew Fafita oh. and Fortify. No. So what what happens? Like, so, do, you, um, do you re-record them or, or what? It, it had nothing to do on our end, um, but uh, we're not. Gonna, <laughs> we're it's all right. We're, we had a bit of difficulties. It's been dealt with, and we're trying to sort it out now. So we'll figure that the out. Footage won't walk about. <laughs> the footage won't walk about. <laughs> Mick, Mick Maynard don't took talk- it with the wind bonus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so we're recording a recap episode today to just keep everyone happy while we try and figure out uh, these other episodes and uh, just with Fafita, say how the fights have gone and how everything's happened since then and what's next. Perfect. So everybody could look forward to that. We have to touch on the big holiday as well. It looks like you guys went to Thailand. We saw on social media. Uh, Thai, any good stories that you guys can share with us from your holiday experience? Um, got pissed. Of course. Um, ate the food. That's about Riveting it. stuff here. I saw, I saw you, were at, you were at some pool parties, Ty. 
some after there was some like day pool party thing. Yeah, You're right. You saw me. <laughs> you saw it's me. part of the job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nah, pool parties. Um, yeah, food. Hung out with the family, the missus and the kid. So it was good. Just relax, really. I remember my back to the. I was going to say, I, I remember Mike Hunt was saying um, he, he almost had like a near-death experience on a scooter in Thailand. Nothing like that. Everything was pretty low-key. No crazy instances or no, happenings. I'm pretty professional. <laughs> when, when I'm with the family, I, um, I, I drive a car, so mm. probably worse. But um, <laughs> yeah, I've been to Thailand a fair bit now, so I'm, I'm like a local around there. Big Thai. Tyson, did you know? Did you, with you being over there as well, did you get any fan recognition from fans over there? We know there's a lot of Aussies that like to go up to Thailand. Did you get many people coming up to you congratulating you on the big win, UFC Perth? I actually, I actually went to Bali. So, but uh-huh. uh, yeah, yeah, there was a few people. And, um, Bali was real good. Uh, it was my first time there. You didn't, you didn't uh, want to I, go I on the it. same holiday with with Ty? You, got, you guys wanted a little bit of a break from each other, different kind of tropical situations? No, I wish they came to Bali. They were already set on Thailand, but what? Uh, Bali's next time. Why Why didn't you want to go to Thailand, Tyson? Was Was Bali... Did Bali oh, have no, something? We just already had it. Yeah, we had it already booked in before we left. Uh, that was all, I all didn't even know that I was going to uh, Bali. Um, Karma, yeah, Karma had us uh, at Karma Kandara, the hotel there. It was beautiful. Uh... Yeah, we didn't even leave the hotel for the first four days. It was that nice. Wow. I feel like Shout it's Shout out a- to Karma. <laughs> Shout out to Karma. I feel like it was like a sneaky tactic, the Polynesian takeover. Ty takes one island, Tyson takes the other island. The plan's all coming together. And we'll just keep doing swapsies. Yeah, exactly. Keep doing swapsies. We're just taking over one country at a time. Yeah, it's it's a good plan. Now, now that you guys are back, how do you sort of look back on the amazing night that you guys had at UFC 221? Ty, we'll, we'll go with you first. What, what was it? Just looking back Maybe. on it now, now, <laughs> now, now that you know the experience what, is what over, you, UFC two twenty one. What'd you call me? <laughs> yeah, it was good. Uh, you know, we trained hard. We went in there to do what we were meant to do, and we, and we did it. We got the job done. Um, so yeah, couldn't ask for, for much more. Good crowd, good good country to be in. So stoked. Like, Tyson, when you kind of look back at being on the same card with Ty and Mark, now that it's all said and done, was it was it a good experience? Was it a bit nerve wracking having to watch you know your close friends fight on the same card? Would you do it again? What was your what's your sort of experience? And look back on it now that it's been a little bit of time since UFC 221. Yeah, no, you can, you can't experience anything like I was going off. I was losing it um, when as soon as I saw Ty win, and obviously hard watching Mark. Uh, take a loss, but it's it's good being everyone uh, everyone being on the same card, and I'd do it definitely do it again. But once the fight was over, we had the um, party, like we had the um, holiday, and now it's just back to work, just ready to do it again. Um, where nothing's locked in yet, but just excited. Uh, just that fight's done now. We add it to the checklist of fighting on the same card with time, exciting times, and now uh, see what's for, what's in the future. Big plans. All right. Well, we want to we want to play a little bit of a game for you guys because there's go. some big there's some big matchups happening in the division. So what we thought was instead of asking you guys who you wanted to fight, we might flip this around a little bit. So Tyson, if you had to pick who Ty's next fight would be in the heavyweight division, who would you choose? What's the name that stands out to you? What fight would you like to see? Oh, it'd be pretty exciting to see him fight uh, the Struve. The Struvenator. Ty, what do you think about that one? Any any interest in uh, in fighting Stefan Struve? No, I'll fight. I'll fight him for sure. I think when I think on Twitter somebody put that idea up, and then someone reminded us about what happened when he fought Mark Hunt. Uh, Ty, do you think it would be a similar outcome if you fought Struve? Ah, oh, I'd I'd be going out there to, to um, knock him out. That's for sure. But um, could could happen? Can't happen? I don't know. Before we go to you, Tyson, uh, you know, Ty, you said some things recently with Flow Combat. You did an interview with them, and you said the whole heavyweight division is just boring. And you kind of alluded that to yeah. that in in the post fight press conference of UFC 221. W- what exactly did you mean by that? Why is it boring? Well, it's boring. Uh, the heavyweights uh, that I used to watch, you know, would be, we'd, it'd be, you know, one or two, just exciting, you know, big hits. Now I think it's just. They're all just going out there, fucking shit. 
boring. Like I feel like watching soccer or something. What 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 about like Ngannou? You know, he he was going out, knocking guys out. Oh yeah, but that's 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 one. I'm talking about the division. Do you, do you uh, well? That's just like saying that's just like Mark Hunt. There's only but before you know there used to be good good fights. But, well, I reckon now I think it's just boring. What about Stepe? Do you, do you rate Stepe as a champion? Oh yeah, he's a good fighter, but you know when he wants to be boring, he can be boring. When he wants to win. Okay, well, Ty, this is your big moment here. Um, we want to know who Tyson Pedro should fight next. I don't know how prepared you are for this because um, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure if you even knew we were doing this interview or not. So <laughs> tell me, if you had to be well, the matchmaker for players. Tyson Pedro, if you were the matchmaker, you're the Joe Silver for Tyson Pedro, and you're going to choose his next fight, what do you choose? Who do you want to see Tyson Pedro fight next? Um, I only know Cormier, so... Cormier. <laughs> All right, Cormier and Tyson Pedro. What, what do you think, Tyson? <laughs> Interested who's in that in one? His thing? Oh, I think Tyson your thing? But uh, it's all good, bro. Don't worry. Don't stress. <laughs> Cormier. That's the only one I know. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, um, they got a. If you if you knew it was going to be a test, you should have let everyone study. study for... <laughs> yeah, we, we should have, we should have let you guys know. That we'll, this we'll, happened. We'll, we'll cop. We'll cop it on the chin, but uh, Ty, so there's been some, Tyson, there's been some exciting matchups proposed. One of them is a, a possible fight with Shogun. I mean, you guys are kind of close in the rankings. A lot of people kind of want to see that fight. Oh, that have, you, fight. Have, you, have you thought about that fight, Tyson? Is that a fight that you'd be interested in, possibly? Any, anyone. I didn't even uh, hear that. That's pretty interesting, but that's a big name. and uh, That is a big yeah, name. Doesn't, that doesn't bother me at all. Like, I'll fight. <laughs> I, I, I said anyone who's ready. That is a big name. He knows someone. He knows someone. <laughs> I was just going to well, say, we, you know it's a big name because Ty knows the show. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. That's pretty cool. I didn't even hear that being thrown around, so see what happens. Hey, you, know, you know what's cool about that is that, you know, this would be a good way to sort of avenge uh, James Tahuna, right? Two birds with one stone? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I guess. it's. Uh, I'm not I'm not an avenger. <laughs> It's uh, 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 like I, I, know, I know what you mean. That, but, uh, even Steve Bose, that, that's another one that was uh, I was I was pretty angry after that fight. But mm. yeah, whatever. If they want to fight, they want to fight. I think I think you're past Steve Bose at this point, Pedro Tyson Pedro. So let's not <laughs> let's not bring him into the conversation just in case he listens to this interview and starts sending emails to McManus trying to get that fight happening. But uh, no, quickly... I'm not stressed at all. But... Yeah, that, 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 it, um, uh, uh, with Shogun, man, that's pretty... I didn't know that was going to turn around. Yeah, I mean, that would be an exciting fight. But let's say you do get Shogun, and let's say you do get Struve tight. Would you guys want to fight again on the same card? Would that be something you guys would be looking at when planning out your next fights? Especially after the success you had in Perth. Yes, I think no. any, any like, time we could get on together would be exactly yeah. awesome. But it has, to work yeah. for, it has to just work out, of course. Yeah, 100%. Exactly the same. Yes and no. It'll be. It's always going to be awesome to find the same card, but at the same time, it doesn't matter. I'd, I'd love to see you guys do it overseas because I think the people on Media Day wouldn't yeah. be prepared for what you guys bring on Media Day <laughs> because it's just, it's just, it's 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 a big ball of energy and it's 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 you know hilarious to watch. On on sort of a, uh, another note, what do you guys think about Daniel Cormier take on Stipe Mircic? Because obviously it kind of concerns both your oh, divisions. Oh, he's fighting heavyweight, eh? Yeah. Yeah. It's I, a like heavyweight, heavyweight I like collide. it. Bro. I like oh, it. And uh, I'll, I'll, it'll be interesting to see if Cormier comes back after, if he wins that. Cause he has, I reckon he has a big shot. He's uh, going to be a good fight. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see if he drops back. What's there to do in light heavyweight after you win that? Yeah. Do you, what, do you think he would? Because I guess the only real fight there would be maybe a John Jones rematch, if that would ever happen. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's a, I think that's the only way he'd come back. What's, what's there to accomplish after you win both two two titles? I reckon it would be a good fight, but I reckon it's keep a win. Yeah, well, what, yeah. How, how come? Why do you uh, think he wins it? I think uh, just call me a small again. He used to be big when he was fighting on heavyweight. Mm. Bigger. I reckon Cormier, I reckon Cormier is going to take it. You reckon? Yeah. I've got a hundred on uh, Steve, uh, Well, let's go. <laughs> hey, this, it, it's on record. It's been yeah. a bit official. Uh, is, there, is there a bet involved here? Whoever... So, Ty's yeah, got... Yeah, there we go. Hundred. 
Okay, well, th- this episode is going to be out, so you guys have no way of getting out of the bed. Just quickly, <laughs> Tyson, Jackson Winklejohn, we know you spent a, a bit of time there. Would you be looking at returning there anytime soon? We know you had amazing success in Perth, just uh, yeah. training here locally. Are you looking to stay local, or do you think you might go back overseas to do some training for your next fight? Yeah, I was planning on heading over in the next couple of weeks. So honestly, I'm just uh, have a have some training over there while I haven't been in camp. Uh, I think like there'll be a good change up. I've only ever gone over there when I'm concentrating on one person, so it'll be good to go over there and learn stuff while I'm not just focusing on another person. Mm. Do you think it's a good idea to maybe bring Ty with you, maybe get the lay of the land on guys like Overeem and other big heavyweights in the gym? No, we've spoken about it before. It's not Ty's style either, the training as well. Um, and, uh, yeah, it just wouldn't suit him. Apparently Jackson Wickle and John makes you run a lot over sand dunes or something like that. Is that true? Ty's a better Ty's a better runner than me. Yeah, Ty, Ty run, Ty's a better runner than I am. Because I remember we were talking to uh, Jackson. We were called John. We were talking about how maybe we'll go over there, spend some time there, just hang out. And he said to us, we go, what do you want to do for fun? Should we go out? Should we go get a drink at the bar? Something like that. And he said his idea of fun is making me and Casper do sprints up a sand dune. So we never made it over there. It was going to be... I noticed, was, you, so, I noticed you sort of uh, st- got away from that little running comment. <laughs> like, <laughs> you, I, hey, I noticed hey, she's hey, really, hey, really hey, trying to get away from that. None of us like to run. None of us I have a feeling, run. did someone do the, the throat cutting motion with the hand? <laughs> don't, cut away. Don't, 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 don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> Tyson's all over us, right media day, day like, this time. Tyson's like that guy that's always going to pull us up on anything. Well, well let, let me ask you this, Ty. How come you, why, why does sort of, I guess, the Australian style of training suit you better than, say, Jackson Winkle, John? And you're an excellent runner. Let's just get that out of the way, all right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, um, I just, um, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know when I, when, I, when I need to, but, um, yeah, I don't really know. I, I I train in the backyard sometimes, so I'm I'm not too fast. I like I like my style. I like what I do. So if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Is that the thing? Is that the saying? Yeah, that's the <laughs> that, that that's the saying. Tyson, I think yeah. you you said you you you, you were going to explain. You were going to add something to that. I uh, just uh, I've explained um uh, how they train over there sometimes, and he's shut it down immediately uh and also like i've uh, taught ty some of the stuff and the way that they break down stuff so small isn't ty's sort of style mm. um yeah eventually like i'm sure he'll go over to somewhere with one of those wrestling camps and some of the heavier dudes well it's going to be exciting to see what's next for you guys as we wrap up let's just quickly talk about the half cast podcast you mentioned you'll be doing a bit of a recap episode now the Rock, it seems like he's on his way up there as well. But what are some other future guests, uh, some other future things coming from the podcast that the fans need to look out for in 2018? Uh, Ty's got some good ideas for a few sketches. So that'll be a cool little thing. Hopefully we'll be adding to it soon. Mm. Uh, we'll be having uh, our own TV show soon, pretty much. <laughs> That's what we'll be doing. Is this, is this like, like we'll, comedy we'll sketches, Tyson? Or? Yeah, yeah. Well, oh, nah, I'm talking about... Are you guys going to feature <laughs> yeah. during the Halfcast podcast, or is it going to be separate, sort of like more on the channel, like as, as separate little clips? No, nah, I think it'll be more on the channel, the way uh, Ty was ex- uh, describing it. So. Yeah. And uh, we're, we're uh, starting to get uh, merchandise. We've had a couple of meetings with um, some other uh, companies. So it's exciting times. Awesome. Well, guys, make sure to follow Considering we're still out of a shed. It's what, sorry? And considering we're still based out of a shed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, make sure to follow Ty and Tyson on Twitter at Tyson underscore Pedro underscore and at Bam Bam Tuivasa. Follow their show on Instagram at the underscore halfcast underscore podcast. And make sure to subscribe to their YouTube. That's, of course, where you could watch the episodes. And you can see episodes of guys like Robert Whitaker, John Wayne Parr, Mark Hunt, and now there's going to be sketches coming. I feel like this is one of the best places fans can go. If you haven't subscribed yet, make sure to do it. There's big things coming in 2018. There's also a bet that's been made on the DC Stipe fight, so we'll see what happens there. And we're excited to see what happens next for you, boys. Thanks so much for coming into the program. We're excited to see what happens next. Thank you very much for having us, guys, again. Cheers <laughs> for having us, boys. Take care. Thanks, Thanks Eves. See you later. Bye. See you, boys. 
Hey, this is Ariel Hawani, and you're listening to Submission Radio with my two favorite mates, Dennis and Casper. Well, it's been too long since we've had this man on, the deputy managing editor at SB Nation's MMA Finding, one of the hardest working guys in the game. You see his awesome articles and work every week. He now joins us here today. I'm, of course, talking about Mr. Mark Ramondi. Welcome back to Submission Radio. It's been too long, man. Thanks for coming on the show. It has been too long. How are you guys? Very good, very good. It's uh, it's good to hear your voice. We normally see you at these international events, but it's great to have you back on the show officially. Uh, thanks for joining us. There's obviously been quite a bit of stuff happening in the world of MMA, but first and foremost, we wanted to sort of get a quick update on what's happening in the world of Mixed Martial Arts Journalists Association. What exactly have you heard, and, and how's it going, Mark? Okay, well, uh, yeah, the, the, there's um, I guess there's been some... Uh, people, people have been wondering what's been going on. Why haven't, why haven't there been any, uh, you know, public statements made? Last week, uh, we announced uh, the, the the association announced that we'll be holding our first elections. Um, and the reason why it took so long to, to kind of get off, get that off the ground, is because we needed to form committees. We needed to form chair people for those committees. We needed to form. Uh, I mean, we're actually starting a brand new process to actually vote digitally for our association whereas you know it's not a paper ballot it's not an in-person ballot so we're actually we developed almost like our own system in a way to to vote for for officers president vice president secretary digitally and it's something that actually jeremy botter has been helping a lot with on the on the website um it's so that's been a little bit of a process from a technological standpoint we wanted to have it done in january taking a little bit longer than we wanted to but the MMAJA is alive and well. We have we have a bunch of members. Uh, it's not it, it, people. Are, I see people, you know, tweet to the MMAJA account. It's uh, it's it's not as easy as it, as it looks to set something like this up. That's a and b. It's not necessarily for fans. It's not it's not for the fans to uh, partake in necessarily. There there may be things going on behind the scenes that fans will never know about. That's, it's not really for the fans, you know, not 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 to be not to be snarky, but mm. it's for the people internally, for journalists, and we're 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 on our way to our goal. I'm I'm the treasurer, and I, right now I'm working on on making it an official nonprofit organization. That's been my role in all of this, and it's a lot of paperwork, and I'm dealing with lawyers <laughs> and and uh, and and the tax people in the United States. So that's a little bit difficult. It's not it's not as easy as maybe some of us thought it would be. It's been a, it's been a process, but I'm very confident that. When we get things up and running smoothly, we're going to be the the, the association will be uh, something that we can all be proud of. Absolutely, and I mean the big historic moment was back in, on the 29th of July, where you guys had your first meeting. And just looking back now, how did you kind of gauge that first meeting? We saw a lot of sort of happy, smiling faces. It looked like it went quite well, but from your perspective, how did it kind of go down? I thought I thought the meeting was great, and I look forward to having another meeting this coming July. Uh, I, I think that the response was was excellent. I thought that the dialogue was really fantastic, and I think that everyone is open to this kind of thing. And and just to just to clarify, you know, we're not a union. We're not representing journalists in some kind of collective bargaining with their employers. It's more of a it's a trade association. It's it's to it's to foster that camaraderie, that relationship between journalists. Even though we're competitors, at the end of the day, we want the same things. We wanted to we want to be treated correctly by the promotions that, you know, there there are little things during fight week that can be corrected that are better for everyone. That Just that kind of stuff. And, you know, if, if, if any promotion wants to uh, mistreat one of the, the association members, that's what an association is for. There There is strength in number. There's strength in unity. And it's just that kind of thing. And then also just to educate and, and uh, to let some of the younger members know and to let the public know what we actually do and what journalism actually is because man how many how many times have you guys heard from fighters for fans and and they have this skewed view of what journalism actually is mm. and what journalists do and you yeah. know we're not we're not there to promote fights we're not there to promote fighters necessarily um you know we're there to to, to uh, do journalism and, and people don't understand that and that's one of the roles of the mmaj as well yeah well i, I was going to say are there any sort of specific examples specific benefits that you could see happening uh, you know once once you know some things are implemented because obviously we speak a lot about fighters needing a union or, or the ali act but you know for media why do you think there is this need for for the association i think i think there's a need for i mean i, th I think everyone everyone should be 
when it comes to like a fight, like fight, just for just for instance, and I'm not I'm not saying there's any particular things about like the UFC fight mm. week media setup that need to be changed necessarily, mm-hmm. but let's let's say they do that the UFC changes things and there isn't as much access or there's something that the vast majority of media does not agree with them doing. That's when that's when the association can get together. We can all talk about it. We can all have a vote. We can all have a dialogue about what what is best for us. You know what is best for the media in these situations. Do we want a press conference? Do we want you know a a, a media scrum or do we want to work out stuff like that? And then we go and then we, we we go to the UFC and say, hey, the consensus of all of our members, all of our 60, 80, 100 members think that this is the best way to go about it. And you have that you have that uh, dialogue. You know we're not going to strong arm anyone. It's not going to be like that. But yeah. but also in cases like if if someone gets banned from an event, we have people in the MMAJA who are currently banned from UFC events. That is not something that we that you want as journalists. That's something that we want to open up the dialogue about. And the best way to do that is to have unity and and, and just that kind of thing. I mean, and just and just also be be more public about what, what being transparent about what journalism is and what we do and, and how we go about our processes, just that kind of stuff. I mean, a lot of it is, it is very general. There's not, there's no one like specific thing. Like, oh, we're gonna go out, and we're gonna, we're gonna change that like right away. There's nothing like that. I mean, there are, le- there are a lot of those things for, for fighters associations and fighters unions that they want to change right away. This is more of we want an existing association that's there, that's that 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 has unity. That when something comes up, we can all talk about it and try and try to make it better for everyone. Mm-hmm. And I get I want to get back around to the banning in a second, but just on dealing with the UFC in general, what what kind of responses have you guys had? Are, are they open to listening to feedback from you guys? Are, are they open to be a part of the discussion, or is it at a point where they're just sort of ignoring it and not really giving it much attention? We we haven't we after the initial communication with them, we did reach out to all of the promotions, their PR people saying that we're going to be doing this. We haven't really had much of a dialogue other than that, other than just the kind of the notification that this is going to be happening. But that's okay. I mean, nothing has come up yet. You know, we're not we're not in we're not in position to do that just yet because we're we were over the last nine months, we were building committees out. We were we were starting the process toward, uh, you know, an election because right now everyone, all the officers, president, vice president, secretary, treasurer, uh, are all interim they haven't been voted on i mean i'm i am the interim treasurer but no one has voted for me i i was just that i was just there to help it get off the ground so if someone else wants to come in and run against me and and be treasurer that person will be elected it'll be a democratic process and then once that there there is much more strength in a in a board in officers that are that have been elected democratically than as an interim board of course so any any kind of communication any kind of dialogue and if there's anything any issues that come up it would, it's always best to have the people who are actually elected to be the to be those front people to do that to do that talking to do that communication and start that dialogue with the UFC belt or whoever. Mm, of course, and I'm I'm just curious, you know, obviously, because when when we're lucky enough to make it down to the US to cover an event, we see you guys doing an amazing job down there. But we know we can imagine behind the scenes, there's probably you know challenges from time to time. How would you say your relationship is like with the UFC now? And would you say things have gotten a little bit better since you know obviously the in- infamous incident where Ariel was unjustly banned for a short period of time after UFC 199? Yeah, I mean the relationship is fine. There there there's nothing. There's no, there's no hard feelings, and 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 yeah, even even with that situation, it yeah, I mean, and yeah, of course, and and even in that situation, of course, there were there were definitely some uh, people took it personally on on both sides, but it, it's also people on both sides who were just trying to do their jobs, even mm. even on the UFC side, which is something that you have you have to, uh, you know, when your boss tells you to do something. What are you, you know? What are you gonna do? Where you know? Well, it's kind of a, there are people that were in that situation on their side too that were that were put in bad positions. We'll say. So I I have I mean nothing against nothing personally against any of those pe- of, of those uh, you know people in the UFC at all. Uh, not at all. You know I know they're just trying to do their jobs the best they can the same way that we're trying to do our jobs the best we can. And and if if there is a happy medium to come between those those two factors, that that is what I think everyone seeks. And sometimes it isn't a happy medium. Sometimes there are issues and there's butting of heads. But that's, I mean, this goes, this this stuff kind of, ha- this happens in every sport, you know, in every corner of, uh, in every, not even just sports. I mean, in, in, in politics, I mean, it happens in every, every 
medium in every type of uh, walk of life that there is journalism and there are people that get covered because the people who get covered see it their way and 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 sometimes they don't they would prefer not to have people uh critical and and not even critical but also just reporting reporting news i mean some people don't don't uh Want, want that kind of thing and and it is, it is the job of a PR person to kind of make sure that whatever gets out is in a, is, is is in a positive light for mm. that company so there are sometimes there are opposing uh, views and, and, and opposing agendas on, on both sides but uh but again the the, the association is is is, is, uh, is existing and will continue to exist to kind of uh, make sure that no one gets singled out on the journalism side um, that's why we're all we're all getting together, uh, you know, as, as one as one unit in in times like if if something happens like like that does. Mm, absolutely, and uh, just putting the focus on MMA fighting for a second. I mean, you guys have been doing a tremendous job for a really really long time, but recently some comparisons have been made to the 1992 USA basketball team because <laughs> you guys are you just uh, <laughs> full of stars. I mean, me and Casper and. You know, Christian and, and Justin and a lot of the other crew, we we see how guys, how hard you guys work every single event. We see how hard you hustle, even though technically many people in your position might kind of take it a bit easier and not worry so much. You guys are at hotels late, you're getting exclusives, you're working through the night. It's it's really great to see. But from your perspective, you know, as, as a part of the team, how long did it kind of take for you guys to kind of get to that position, to this all-star level? Do you remember the first time you kind of noticed this amazing collection of people you guys kind of had under one umbrella because it's kind of like watching the Avengers of Justice League happen. <laughs> well, when I when I came on board in in uh, in 2014, the staff was already fantastic. So I was I was kind of coming as 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 a free agent. I was kind of like uh, like when the Yankees signed like a bit a big a uh, big free agent. Not that I, not that I was like that, <laughs> that big at the time, but when the when the Yankees are already adding to like their their all star cast so i was they were right they were already MMA fighting was already fantastic in 2014 when i joined i'd like to think that i that, I, that i've helped uh, at least a little bit raise that and and you know we've added you know the alexander k lees of, of the world and the pt carols of the world and the, and the danny segurs of the world and uh, i mean i can't say enough about our staff and and what what you already said uh about about the hard work that's really the biggest thing to me cause because I, I think we have the most talented staff in mma but it, it always it, it, it always blows my mind. It never ceases to amaze me on a weekly basis. Everyone willing to go and 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 go go beyond you know the, the go beyond the the steps of, of, of doing what they're doing you know uh, above and beyond and and even, the, even no one's resting on their laurels even though I think we have an extremely talented staff. Um, you know Esther and Casey uh, on on the video and photo side like these are people who are working really really hard. And, and not just coasting and not just coasting based on their talent. I mean, that, that is probably the thing that I love most about, about the staff. Yeah, they are, they are very, very talented. I guess, you know, guess sometimes you know. even even here at Submission Radio, you know, we'll release an interview or something with someone and we kind of worry from time to time. What if, you know, what if we release this interview and it kind of affects our future? Because sometimes people don't have the nicest things to say. Sometimes some news breaks out and you feel like, ooh, like, this is news, but what kind of backlash are we going to face after mm-hmm. we put this out? I mean, as the managing editor of one of the biggest MMA websites in the world, I mean, the biggest MMA website in the world, I mean, you guys have a lot of pull, you have a lot of power, you know, crazy amount of traffic, but how often do you grapple with that feeling of sort of what kind of backlash you guys have to deal with for putting something out? And do you think it's kind of it's kind of weird in this day and age that you kind of, it, it is on the back of your mind? I don't know if it's on the back of your mind, but if it is, do you think it's kind of weird that it is sort of there all the time? I mean, it really, it really depends on what the story is. It's the, it, every story is different, and the, there are different reasons why a story would give you pause when you're reporting on it. Uh, I, I don't. I mean, yeah, these are these are things that we think about. We we talk about really on a daily basis when when a story comes up. Um, you know, in MMA, it's it's not. It, it isn't crime reporting it isn't court mm. reporting although sometimes there are those things <laughs> incorporated in it um so it isn't uh i mean at, at the end of the day i would say like 80 percent of our site if not more is just about is just about fighting and fights and 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 you know previews of fights and analysis of fights and and things that everyone wants to read and and some things are not and some things are, are hard news stories and and they do make people uncomfortable um but if it's if it's the truth then we have uh, you know we have the sources to back it up 
and 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 we trust those sources and and we we uh, we feel like it's it's newsworthy enough to, to run with. We're going to do it, and we try not to think about too much about what you know a backlash would be, um, because the truth is, the truth is is always is always your 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 backup. You know, if if it's if it's the truth and if it's newsworthy. I mean, I guess the the, the idea of newsworthiness is something that uh, can be open to interpretation and, and can be subjective, but I mean, yes, sometimes the backlash is unwarranted. I mean. Look, we, fan, fans get upset about about all different kinds of things when we report on them. Fans are upset when we write about Ronda Rousey now, even though uh, <laughs> she's uh, one of the most dominant women's fighters, one of the most dominant fighters of all time. She's still technically on the UFC roster. She's in the UFC rankings. She has fought in the UFC more recently than Conor McGregor. Um, and sh- and people get upset because we're writing about her in WWE. If any if any UFC star was was doing a TV show. We would be writing. We'd be writing about that if you know Luke Rockhold does gets a modeling job. We write about that. That's just how it. That's just how it goes. Um, and people, for some reason, get very upset when we write about Ronda Rousey doing WWE. Uh, these are, that's a very newsworthy thing. Uh, you know, I think most people would agree with that. Yeah, people get upset about it. So sometimes you don't know what what's going to get people upset. But uh, I mean, I've had people tell me when I write an article about someone getting arrested or so, or something like that saying that I'm like TMZ like that's not I mean that's not TMZ is like a, I mean a gossip site this is actually this is real news this is like the truth it's like I have, a, I have a police report you know in front of me on my computer screen what are you talking about you know this is not gossip so I mean you can never you can never really uh, you know in, in some cases you do have to take into account uh, what the opinion of others is going to be but you have to also trust your journalistic instincts when, when you're doing these things. Mm. And I mean, you guys run an amazing website. Other SB Nation websites, you know, great, you know, bloody elbow with a lot of great, great articles, a lot of great uh, websites out there. But recently, there has been a big influx of websites that maybe have a lot of clickbait articles, you know, that are under the MMA brand. And there's sort of this mixed sort of, I suppose, thoughts and theories in the MMA media community that, you know, a lot of these kind of websites kind of give the MMA media, I suppose, group in general, a bit of a bad name when you see them pop up and it kind of it gives certain PR people and certain companies a bad idea of what sort of MMA websites are about. W- where do you sit on that? And do you think what do you think we're at when it comes to this clickbait stuff and these websites just kind of looking to get as many people to their page as possible? Yeah, I mean, it's I, I think this is also a thing that happens in every in other sports and happens, you know, in, in every in every type of thing that gets covered online. Uh, I saw one of these sites, and I'm not even going to mention the name of the site, and this is something they've done now a couple times in the last few weeks, actually tweeting stories from like two or three years ago with <laughs> some kind of sensational headline. And you click on the link, and I, and like an idiot, of course, I clicked on it. And I, I got fooled by the clickbait myself, so obviously it works. And it's from 2016. It's a, it's a news story from 2016. I mean, it, it's a two-year-old story that they're presenting as, as news um, now, and, and that's, I mean that's an extreme example of just, that's just ridiculous. Um, and, and there's more, there's more subtle examples of, of, of misleading or incorrect things. And, and yeah, I think it's, I think it's a big problem. I think that in, in all walks of life and, and all, even, you know, in like politics and, and there are sites that will take like, let's say the New York times reports a story and some website, some, you know, one, uh, a website that's not very reputable, takes the New York Times news and kind of uh, twists it around and skews it and slaps on a clickbait headline and then and he still says New York Times in the story and that kind of makes everyone look bad like mm. when when uh, you know it's it, it's it's uh it's it's a it's it's unfortunate now I mean I we get accused of clickbait we've gotten accused of clickbait by Dana White um, uh, himself he, he's he said that we're that we're a clickbait site man I'm, I'm telling you I I try my hardest every single day to put out headlines that represent what the story says the best i possibly can and uh some people i think i think the word clickbait is kind of is kind of overused now yeah but certainly uh, to get back to your question there are there are certain sites that they use that a lot and look i mean i think at the end of the day i think that maybe in the short term that kind of stuff works and you get you get those clicks but there's a certain uh, there's a certain uh 
you know, when you when when the the people who do click through and they fool for the clickbait and they see that it's a BS article and they see that it's you know it's it's nothing like what was said in the headline or it's from two years ago, which I think is ridiculous. <laughs> I think that you, it does deteriorate the trust of that website and eventually, eventually you would hope that people no longer get fooled and no longer go to that website. But yeah, I mean, it, it does seem like you know when people are just chasing those 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 clicks and they'll do anything to get them, even put out ridiculous things on, on Twitter or, or Facebook. Mm. Mark, we really appreciate your your time and obviously your insight and, and honesty about, uh, you know, the MMA JA and a lot of things sort of behind the scenes. Just before we let you go, I wanted to get your thoughts on a couple of things that are happening in the MMA world. One of them, of course, is uh, Luke Thomas highlighted on Twitter some of the issues with the UFC rankings. He pointed out on a Reddit post mm-hmm. with a post pointing out, you know, that despite being ranked number four in the UFC's own rankings, Cain Velasquez actually doesn't hold a win over a single opponent in the top 15. What do you think of the rankings, you know, the way they're currently done? And is it time for a change? Is there sort of a conceivable change that you see happening, uh, you know, I, I guess in the short term or the long term? We've heard theories that, you know, maybe the rankings should just disappear because some fighters are sort of using that as leverage and reasons not to fight certain other fighters. Do you think that would even be possible? And if so, how, how could the UFC just all of a sudden get rid of rankings? Yeah, the rankings are something so... I think I forget exactly what year they started. I want to say it was around 2012 or 2013. And uh, I remember I was I was with FoxSports.com, and I really did not want to be in the rankings panel. A lot a lot of the sites at that point, and a lot of the journalists at that point were were already at, didn't want to do the rankings because, uh, you know, journalists their their votes should not. I mean, these are like you said, the rankings can be something that that fighters can use uh, in contract talks and. And that kind of stuff, and and I'm not I'm not always down with the fact that you know journalists directly affecting how much a fighter gets paid. I mm. mean, I, there there are certain cases. I mean, I know like the AP, like the Associated Press, does rankings by college football, that kind of thing. I mean, it's a little different in, in that way. The thing that really I think upset people was when Nate Diaz was in the rankings. I think he was in the top five or the top ten, and he was having a contract dispute with the UFC. So immediately they pulled him right from the they pulled him from the rankings. <laughs> So you could so even as a journalist you couldn't even vote for him. He wasn't even available there to vote for. So to me, that corrupted that corrupted the rankings uh, completely. And after that, I didn't I didn't do them again. I, I, I at FoxSports.com they actually wanted me to do them. My boss wanted me to do them. Um, so I did them, but I also wrote a column every week, kind of blasting the people who were giving it <laughs> bad rankings. So that, yeah. that was my compromise. I'm like, I'll do them, but I'm gonna write a column every week blasting uh, the rankings. Uh, uh, people so i did that at fox sports and then when i left foxsports.com i no longer did the rankings but the nate diaz thing was a big one and they've done that a few times since and and some of the things they've done is 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 head scratching and the people i they're really they're, there are a few people who i like who are, who are still voting for the rankings but the vast majority of of the the journalists that we all know and respect the people from mma fighting from mma junkies from people from sure dog uh espn i mean uh bleacher report most of these people uh, who we know are reputable journalists, people who are in the MMAJA are not voting on these rankings. And the, the people who are left, I don't. a lot of them I don't even know. I mean, I've been doing this now for, for a number of years, guys, and I don't even know some people who are doing these rankings. So there is that, that is, that is uh, an inherent, inherent problem right there. Um, I don't think anyone should take them seriously uh, because I, I, some, I don't know who these journalists are. I don't know if they're following the sport, some of them. I have, I have no idea. I don't know if they have agendas. I don't know. I don't know. I have no idea. Um, I... I the only reason the UFC ever got rankings in the first place, though, was for marketing purposes. It, mm. It's got nothing to do with anything. It was never really going to be a true indicator of who the best in the world was going to be. What they wanted was to show on Fox, oh, hey, this is number one versus number two, or this is number four versus number five, just to, add, to give context to who these people are to a casual viewer. That is the only reason why the rankings exist, and it probably is the only reason why rankings continue to exist. I, I think rankings are good. I think, I mean, rankings in, sport, in sports are good, but the current system, what they do, it needs to be completely blown up. I, I, don't, I, don't, know, I don't know what they can do instead, because if the UFC does it themselves, there's obviously you know, an inherent conflict of interest there. And I don't think at this point... If the UFC has them under their umbrella as far as official UFC rankings, they're on the UFC's site and they can pull people whenever they want. Most reputable journalists will not vote on them. So there, need, there needs to be some. I mean, 
maybe maybe it, down the line the MMAJA can can vote on and re- vote on rankings and, and there can be like the official the official MMA rankings because like, I mean there are official rankings in in other sports that that get voted on by journalists or or even coaches I mean in in college football there's like the co- there's a coaches poll I don't know if coaches in, in MMA are going to do that or or fighters themselves are going to do that but Whatever whatever happens next, what was working right now, what, what is what is going on right now is not working. I think it, it should probably be just blown up. I mean, it's it's kind of it's a pile of crap. I mean, let's just look at some of that <laughs> some of that stuff. It's terrible. It's it's sometimes it's my morning coffee routine where I have a good laugh in the morning and go off and do whatever I need to do. So it does bring me comedy in my life, Mark. Don't blow it up just yet. Finally, well, we, yeah, if, be... you're, if, you, if you're looking at it from a strictly entertainment an entertainment point of view, then it's fine. And I think that's really all the UFC wanted in the in the first place was. For a mark for marketing and entertainment, it was never supposed to be taken seriously, <laughs> but yet fighters talk about it all the time, and, and people see it. And but it's it's a fi- it's quote unquote official, but I mean I think we all we all know the truth. It's it's really it's it's nothing. It's terrible. They need they need to insert an automatic laugh track every time you open that page, <laughs> just to sort of suit the situation. But Mark, we've been greedy with our time, so we'll let you go, guys. Make sure to follow Mark on Twitter at Mark underscore Monday and read his amazing work on MMAfighting.com. Without a doubt, you know the best website out there. It's a real pleasure. Whenever we see you guys, when we talk to you guys, whenever we can pick your brain, thank you for coming back on the program. It's been too long, Mark. We have to get you back on sooner. Have a great day over there in the U.S. And thanks again for coming on to Submission Radio. Thanks so much, guys. Hey, this is Tony Okagui Ferguson, and you guys are listening to Submission Radio. Keep tuning in, guys. All right, guys. Our next guest is coming up. A huge win over Mark Hunt at UFC 221. He now takes on another legend in Alistair Overham at UFC 225 in his hometown of Chicago. A man that represents the new generation of UFC heavyweights. He is Curtis Razorblades. Curtis, welcome to Submission Radio for the very first time. How are you today, man? I'm good, man. Just uh, head back to Chicago. Leaving, uh, no, heading back to Denver. Leaving Chicago right now. Oh, cool. So, are you are you in the car right now, driving down, or is that a plane ride for you? What's what's the process like? Uh, yeah, we're driving. Uh, we, me and my roommate, uh, we we made a impromptu uh, road trip off here a couple of days ago. And then we're just now heading out. Oh wow! How how how's the road trip going so far? Any crazy stories? Oh no, it's a lot of empty empty lands. We're driving through. I don't know if you guys uh, on how old your American geography is, but we're driving through Iowa and then we're going to drive to Nebraska. Those are probably two of the most boring, boring places to drive through. <laughs> how how can mm. you guys wanted to do the road trip then if it's if there's not really much to see on the way? Oh, we just wanted to go home. Oh, we're both from the uh, Chicago area. We had a buddy. Yeah, uh, I this past weekend in Iowa. Yeah. So we said we drive up to this night, and then it's only two hours away to get to Chicago. So we decided to drive, to drive out from Iowa. All right. Well, I mean, all road trips aside, we have to give you a belated birthday uh, celebration as well. You turned 27 shortly after you win over Mark Hunt in Perth. Tell us, what was the celebration like? Um, I actually, uh, I went home. I went back to Chicago for my birthday and I uh, just had a couple of beers with my friends and my family at a local bar, a bar I used to work at. And, uh, and I went to go see the movie uh, Black Panther with my brother. Mm. That was about it. What, what did you think of the movie, Black Panther? I haven't seen it. I'm pretty sure Dennis has, though. What, what, what was the Curtis Blades uh, movie review like? Oh, I mean, I loved it. Uh, Marvel, they always do good. Uh, they haven't, haven't let me down yet. It's not the best Marvel movie, but it's hard to be the best out of all those, like, all the Iron Mans and Avengers. It's hard to top those. But uh, it, it definitely impressed me. I'm looking forward to the, the sequel. Yeah, for sure. Well, what, well, if you say it's not the best one, which one do you think is the best one? Which is currently your favorite? Uh, I would say uh, this one is Captain, yeah. uh, Captain America, uh, the the newest one. Uh, yeah. Uh, I feel like I feel like there's some cheat. I feel like there's some cheating going on there, Curtis. Are you getting some help from a friend? <laughs> uh-huh. 
forgot the name of it. We could, we could hear him in the background, no cheating allowed. But, I mean, the real present must have been getting this fight in Chicago because we know at the post-fight press conference, in Perth, you were you were vocal about the fact that you wanted to be on the card. For people that don't know, tell us, why was it such an important thing for you to fight in Chicago yet again? And what does it mean for you to officially be fighting in Chicago, especially a guy like Alistair Overeem, who is another massive legend in the heavyweight division? Well, I mean, it means a lot, you know, uh, Fighting at home in front of your friends and family, especially because majority of the time um, they don't really do a whole lot of cars in the Chicagoland area. So they do like they do one like once every two years. So uh, I'm just I'm really happy to get be able to get on the car, you know. And going against Alistair, that's a big deal regardless of where I am, even if we were fighting like in uh, Vegas or New York, it would be a big deal regardless. But to do it at home makes it just more special to me. Mm. You, you haven't fought in Chicago since your first couple of fights in MMA. And, uh, you know, this fight obviously taking place at the United Center, which is no small deal. Do you, do you have any special memories when you were growing up, of, you know, being there and wanting to one day be the one that, you know, people came to see? Oh, yeah, I used to go there with my dad back in the 90s when the Bulls were at the height. Mm. I can't remember all of it, but I got pictures and stuff, so I know I was there. And uh, I mean, I never, I never once imagined I would be like performing or competing at the United Center because I'm not that good at basketball, so <laughs> I definitely don't play hockey. So I never, I didn't think I'd have a chance to ever do that. I mean, so many great moments at the United Center, the Chicago Bulls, absolutely legendary team. Did you ever get a chance to meet Jordan or did you ever get close to meeting like Pippen or any any of the other, Kerr, any of the legendary guys from the Bulls team? Not that I can remember. I have to ask my dad. He probably did. He was, he's a, a huge basketball fan. He played in high school and college. And, uh, yeah, he, he may have. I have to ask him. All right, well, uh, just regarding this Overeem fight, I mean, you said that you didn't really want to call anyone out, but behind the scenes, did you ask for Overeem, or was that just the guy offered to you? No, I didn't ask for Overeem. The reason I didn't want to call anyone out, because there's no need to. Everyone, I'm ranked number five, so me going against Kane would have been a great fight. Me going against Verdun would have been a great fight. Me going against Ngannou again would have been a great fight. It didn't really matter who they gave me it, it would have been a good fight. But they're all great fighters. They all present different challenges and different... Uh, uh, the, strategy, the strategy remains the same to beat them all, but uh, it, would, it would be a good fight regardless. That's why I didn't feel the need to drop any names. Absolutely. I mean, it's a kind of a good, um, I feel like you're setting a good example for a lot of other fighters when uh, we have a lot of people kind of calling people out it looks like you're being rewarded without really sort of talking trash or calling anyone out. Do you feel kind of like it's paying off a little bit, the fact that you have been so respectful and it's kind of it kind of shows people you can still get good fights without without being disrespectful post by press conferences? Yeah, um, it is something I did want to, I don't know, I, I didn't want to like directly call attention to it, but yeah, I'm not, that's not really my, my style, the whole, calling out and being extra aggressive. I mean, we're getting paid to a fight regardless. I don't have to hate you. I don't hate you. I don't hate my opponents. Uh, I respect them for getting in the, the octagon with me. I respect anyone who wants to get in the octagon. And um, I just feel like at the core of being a martial artist, one of the core principles of being a martial artist is respecting your other competitors and your other uh, opponents, uh, regardless of if you're doing it in front of millions or if you're just in the gym, you should always be respectful. Mm. You compared Mark Hunt to uh, the Michael Jordan of MMA. Where does Alistair Overeem rank to you when it comes to sports references? Uh, I mean, he's he's up there also. He's like a Patrick Ewing or Carl Malone. He's one of the greats. Yeah, he's, he's certainly a legend in the sport. At the same time, this kind of feels a lot like the UFC is priming you for contention, and they're sort of trying to use Overeem to put you over. Do you sort of get that feeling as well? 
Um, I mean, yeah, I feel like I'm getting a bit more of a push, but um, this isn't a trap fight for him or me. This is it's just good matchmaking. It's it's really the only fight that made sense because they weren't going to give him Engano again. Mm. They weren't going to give him another title shot without beating someone else. They weren't going to give him Mark Hunt again. They weren't going to give him. It was either me or Kane, and I'm guessing maybe Kane's injured still. I don't know what's going on with that, but he would have been have too many options. So it only made sense that it would be me and him. Well, he's currently ranked number two. What do you think a win over over him would do for you? Do you think that that kind of gets you the next title shot after this whole Stipe DC fight is figured out mid this year? Absolutely. Once again, I feel like that's the only matchup that makes uh makes the most sense. I mean, we all we're all deserving of a title shot, but I think I beat Alistair. I'm next. It's my turn. And I think that's why, you know, people are kind of sleeping on this fight a little bit. I think without, you know, realizing it, this is actually like a number one contender fight. I don't know if the stakes are the same for Overeem, but given your current streak, you know, the win over Mark Hunt, you know, a win over Overeem, I think this gives you the next title shot. Just curious, you mentioned Kane. Do you think he'd have the right to leapfrog you into a title fight anyway if he, if he came back, you know, giving his history of, of a champion? Or do you think this win sort of, you know, really solidifies you that shot? Uh, I would go with the latter. I think me winning, me beating Alistair, the number two contender right now, and Kane coming off such a long layoff, no disrespect. But like I said, I beat Alistair. It's my turn. Well, let's talk about the matchup for a second because it's going to be a very fun fight. How do you think he match up against Overeem? How do you think this fight kind of plays out? Um, I think it's pretty much a extension of my last like he's he's taller and he doesn't. I'm not gonna say he doesn't have power because he does, but he doesn't have like Mark Hunt's legendary KO power. But it's pretty much an extension of that. I gotta watch his watch his uh his hands, watch his feet, and use my boxing to get in get in close enough to get the take down, and then from there do what I do best. Yeah, you, you mentioned earlier how the game plan stays the same. You mentioned you, you dominated Mark Hunt, but you know, obviously you got into a little bit of trouble at one point on the feet, and afterwards you said that you adjusted your game plan to kind of realize that you had to stick to what you know best. How do you feel your striking is coming along since then? Do you feel like you'll sort of you know test it out a little bit more against Overeem, or do you think you'll sort of look to just make him uncomfortable and, and, and put him on his back? And I guess, you know, was that a good learning experience against Mark Hunt? As my hands grow, it's, it's going to open up my my wrestling is, oh yes uh, I do plan on doing I just plan on doing what I have to do like if he gives me a uh, a wide open takedown 10 seconds into the fight and then yeah I want to take it I doubt he does that but if, if that's what he did then I would I would attack the opportunity I present it but um, he's he's a smart fighter he's not going to he knows what I want to do it's not Rockets uh, he knows I want to go to the ground He's going to do his best to not allow it. I have to not force the takedown. So if I have to strike, I'll strike for as long as I have to. But the opportunity will present itself. I will get him on the ground. Speaking of, I mean, the division as a whole, we mentioned the fight before, and I just want to get your thoughts on it as well. What do you think about this fight between Stipe and DC that's happening mid this year? And if you had to sort of pick a person who wins that one, who are you leaning towards? Because we know DC was a very, very successful heavyweight before this. Uh, Stipe has been, you know, one of the best champions of all time. It's a tough one to pick. You're right. It is a tough one. This is a this is another great matchup uh, to put uh, Daniel Cormier, who is, I think he's undefeated as a heavyweight, if I'm not mistaken, uh, to put him against, as you said, Possibly the greatest heavyweight champion we've we've had. I think it's a great matchup, and uh, I, I'm going with Stipe. Uh, I think it's going to be a banger. I think it's going to be five rounds of just like John Jones's last, not not his last one against uh, these Steve, but the first fight against <coughs> each other. I think it's going to go like that. They're both going to get rocked. They're both going to get taken down. They're both going to get cut and and have bruises and whatnot. But I think that DC's 
length and his boxing. And he, people don't, people don't understand that I actually trained with him a couple years ago. Yeah. I wrestled with him. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to toot my own heart, but I think, I, I think I'm one of the better wrestlers like, overall, regardless of weight class in the UFC right now. And his, his wrestling is legit. He is very good. So when you guys sort of, you know, were, were sparring and training and stuff, it was pretty competitive between you and Stipe, right? Pretty back and forth? Just with the wrestling. On the feet, he destroyed me. I was an amateur. <laughs> this was back in 20, 2013. I mean, like, I, I'm i one of those guys, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm being real. Like, yeah. someone is better than, like, he was leaps and bounds better than me. He was supposed to be. Like, at the time, he was going against Gabriel Gonzaga. Mm. So, yeah, it would have been weird had, had they brought me in there. I just... Started picking them apart. That probably would have been a problem for Stephen. Mm. <laughs> but no, he he handled me like he's supposed to. But when we wrestled, it was like you said, pretty back and forth. He would get a, we would go, I guess, an hour practice. He would get two takedowns. I would get two takedowns. Or maybe he would get one more. Maybe I would get one more. Do you feel like you're sort of, you know, obviously that was years ago. Do you feel like you're sort of on that level now to where you can be competitive with him and beat him? Because, you know, like we mentioned, you're knocking on the door of a title shot. There's a good chance you're going to be facing Stipe, you know, after this Overeem fight. And I, I saw in an interview you did a, a while back, you, you mentioned how you, you're not on Stipe's level just yet, but I think you will be in about three months, which I found interesting at how and at just yeah. how honest you were about that. I don't think it's been three months yet, but do you feel like you're getting to that level where, you know, you can compete with anyone in the division, even Stipe? Yeah, absolutely. As a top athlete, that's the mindset that you have to have. You cannot go, especially really in any sport, basketball, baseball, rugby, whatever, but really in a fight, you cannot go into a fight with the mindset, oh, this guy's better than me. I hope I can win it. No, I'm, when I, whoever I fight, I fully believe in my training. I believe in my coaches. I believe in the preparation and the work I've put in throughout my eight to 12 week camp. I believe in all that. And I believe I've done enough work to come out victorious. Uh, regardless of if my, if my opponent is Mark Hunt or Alistair or Stipe, I want to put in the work needed to get the W. But I'm not in it just, just to collect the check. I like winning and I hate losing. Mm. Well, we appreciate the time, Curtis. We'll let you go in just a second. I just want to go back to the press conference at UFC 221. You mentioned that you kind of felt a little bit disrespected. Just going back to that, what did that stem from? And do you feel like it's been rectified? Oh, I mean, I was, at that time, I was not going to lie, I was emotionally charged uh, because I had just won and I wasn't, expecting like I wasn't expecting a standing ovation but at the same time I wasn't expecting to be continually booed. So I was a little emotionally heated. So when they when I was being asked those questions, uh I may I may have overreacted a little bit, uh in in hindsight. They weren't disrespectful. It was just I wasn't used to not used to being booed. I'm I'm used to people liking me i'm i'm a people pleaser you know mm. so it's just a little different so just to clarify because i think you know people might have taken that as maybe something to do with the ufc and maybe not pushing you enough it wasn't anything to do with the ufc disrespecting you it was, oh, it was, no, it was, no. it was just more the fans on the night is, is that correct no. yeah yeah it wasn't the ufc of course no the fact that they, they keep giving me new contracts that that means they believe in me that means they Lose my potential, and they they trust that I'm gonna return the investment they they're putting into me. So it was definitely no disrespect there. Mm. All right, well, it, it's good to clarify, but just speaking of disrespect, I mean, the ultimate disrespect, you're still not in the UFC video game, the latest one, even after the recent updates. I mean, that's pretty much sacrilegious. H- have you gotten a reason why? Why no Curtis Blades in the UFC 3 game yet? I have no idea. Uh, I'm kind of scared to ask, so I'm just not going to ask. But, <laughs> yeah, I, I keep hoping they're going to make me, like, a downloadable character or, like, one day I'm just going to wake up and get a bunch of tags that I'm in the game. But yeah. it hasn't happened yet. Hopefully after this one, 
Well, it's it's an exciting journey here. We also saw one of one of the side things that we saw was that you're actually a really big Dragon Ball Z fan. We we just wanted to check in with you. How long has this been going on for? Is this one of those things happening from a young age? Yeah, I got into Dragon Ball Z when I was like, I don't know, seven or eight. I've been watching. I kind of fell off a little bit these last couple months. I've been kind of busy, but I definitely plan on binge, binge watching the newest uh He's in the Dragon Ball. See, this is something that we have in common, Curtis, because uh, when, when we were going to school, Dragon Ball Z was the only thing that would get us out of bed, uh, you know, so we could watch it on, um, what was it, on, on, on this thing we had here called Cheese TV, and they had all the best shows, Pokemon, Dragon Ball Z, everything. Dragon Ball Z was our jam. Who's your favorite character, Curtis, and who do, who do you see yourself as, as the most? Are you a Goku kind of guy? Are you a Piccolo kind of guy? Or are you maybe one of the bad guys? Um, my favorite character. There's a lot of the characters. Um, <laughs> I think my favorite character is probably Vegeta. Because mm. I like how he went from being like a like bad guy to being like one of the best heroes. Yeah. You know? Kind of like a redemption story. Yeah. He's a bit of an underdog. He's always getting beaten by Goku, but then it kind of fuels him and to, to train harder. Yeah. Do, you, do, you, do you sort of like that as well about him? Yeah. Yeah. I like his attitude. He never gives up, even when he's getting getting his butt kicked. Mm. Like he's he's gotten beat up a lot. Like he's like he's been he he died a couple times. Like he's been through it, but he don't give up. Yeah, I like that. And he has a hot wife. Yeah, mm. Bulma. Bulma. He got some. <laughs> got some relationship goals as well because Bulma will piss him off from time to time but he puts up with it man he puts up with it happy wife happy life I think is Vegeta's motto and also as a kid which death did you find the toughest because there were a lot of tear-jerking moments for us especially Krillin that guy had a rough run in Dragon Ball yeah, Z yeah that was probably the worst one for me I was I was going to go to that one that's always the, the tear-jerker hmm I think I think the first one. I think I think when uh, Freezer took him out. I think I think that was pretty sad. I was pretty upset for a week. <laughs> yeah. We could uh, yeah. we we could talk about yeah. Dragon Ball Z and other things with you all day, Curtis. But um, we got we got to let you go. We're being too greedy with our time. As we let you go, just quickly, got to get the official prediction from you. How do you see yourself beating Alice over him at UFC two twenty five and and stamping your way to it to a, the next title shot? Uh, I can envision it in a multitude of ways. Uh, maybe taking them down, taking this back, or, or just a ground and pound TKO. Maybe I even catch him on his feet. Uh, but regardless, I am going to get the W. Well, it's going to be an exciting time, guys. Make sure to catch Curtis Blades fight Alistair over him at UFC 225, June 9th or June 10th here in Australia and New Zealand at the United Center in Chicago at an iconic arena. And also, of course, follow him on Twitter at RazorBlades265. Curtis, we hope you have a safe trip back. No shenanigans. Watch out for those aliens. Don't mm-hmm. go any crop circles. And we look forward to seeing you fight UFC 225. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I appreciate you guys having me on the show. Hey, this is Alistair Overeem, and you are listening to Submission Radio. All right, guys. Our next guest spent his fighting career as one of Ireland's most exciting and beloved fighters, a former cage contender, featherweight champion. He now coaches the famous SBG Island with guys such as Conor McGregor, Artem Lobov, Chris Fields, James Gallagher, and many others, as well as his own gym, SBG Charlestown, Dublin, where he trains the next crop of future champions, the man who has been known as Rowdy long before running to Rousey. Rowdy Owen oh, Roddy, welcome to <laughs> back to Submission Radio, mate. As is the traditional greeting, what's the crack or what's the story, as you say in your vlogs? Uh, I'm, I'm good, man. I'm good. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I love, I love the intro. Um, yeah, I'm good. And, and yourself, how are you? Yeah, no, we're good. And we're happy to have you on the program. The Owen Roddy vlogs, by the way, have really taken off since their original inception. Tell us just quickly, yeah. what made you want to do them kind of in the first place? Because when we kind of look back to the team, you you were kind of the first guy to kind of get out there, get the camera out and really bring that kind of different look to behind the scenes of what's yeah. happening with your team. You know what? It was just one of one of the guys in the gym said he thought it'd be great just to to, to give people a little insight of, um, you know, what goes on in the camp. And I didn't really think that, no, I just done it kind of for a laugh to, to let people, you know, have a look. And uh, and uh, the, a friend of mine, um, he said, oh, well, I'll, I'll, sorry about that. That's my alarm going off. Um, mm-hmm. I'll do, uh, he said, I'll, I'll, I'll edit them. Um, 
I'll uh, edit the videos and stuff like that. So, so we took it from there. The thing I love about him is there's a lot of times where you're sort of just talking to the camera and it, it gives people a good, uh, I guess, opportunity to sort of get your insights and, you know, a lot of your knowledge and sort of, I guess, add framing to like some of the stuff we're seeing. But we got to say, we were, we were stalking you on Instagram and we see a lot of healthy food, yeah. a lot of good nutritional choices. And we think for someone who, you know, yeah. no longer has to make the weight, why are you eating so healthy and why aren't you just smashing burgers oh, like know. the rest of us? <laughs> I don't know. It's weird because I mean I used to be smashing burgers when I was when I was competing. Yeah. It's weird. I, 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 I'm doing things backwards. I think you know what? It's just um, I don't know. Maybe I'm getting a little bit older, and it's, you know, my diet is affecting me. When I was when I was fighting, my metabolism was at such a fast metabolism that I could really eat what I wanted, and I was training so much. You know, it was, people would know me for being like obsessed when I was when I was competing. I used to train three times a day and. You know, when I wasn't playing and I was I was, I was constantly doing some sort of activity. And now as I'm getting a little bit older, I'm not getting to train as much. I, I feel a little bit sluggish in the diet. I'm, I'm kind of supplementing the lack of training for, for being more, more cautious on, the, on, on what I'm eating. And, you know, I feel great. I feel great now. With, uh, since I retired, oh, I'm feeling fantastic. I'm, I'm training. I'm, I'm healthy. I'm enjoying everything, you know. Mm. We got a look of disgust from John Kavanagh when we were here in Australia with him and we tried to stop by a McDonald's. He wasn't very happy about that. So I can, I can understand why the switch and die. Just quickly, while we're talking about diets, we've got to get your thought on the new Burger King commercial, the spicy, crispy chicken sandwich. Is all the rage at the moment. What did you think of it? Did you, does it actually play on TV in Ireland? Do you guys actually have a big thing yeah, down there as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I seen it. I seen it. It's deadly. Ah, oh, you gotta love it, man. It's crazy. <laughs> I haven't tried one yet. Now I haven't had a chance to try one. So, I, but it's weird. I'm like, I'm craving one now. I'm look. I've seen the ad a couple of times now at this stage, and I'm like, I, I need to try one. I just need to have one just to see what the crack is. But uh, it um, it looks tasty. And I'll, if if the king um. If the king is back and it's got to be good. Do you do you or the team get free burgers from Burger King now? I'm, I'm picturing a situation like in Seinfeld where Kramer's getting unlimited cafe lattes. Yeah. You know what? i got to get on to the man himself and find out, man. I, I, I think that should be part of the clause. Anything yeah. anything he does like that, he, the, the team should get free stuff. So free, free, um, free uh, Burger King sounds good to me. Mm -mm. I want you guys to get those free burgers, but then I'm picturing Ben Stiller at the end of Dodgeball. And I'm, I'm hoping that doesn't happen to the whole team. But anyway, it, you know, I mean, a lot, a, a lot of stuff is happening with you guys, and you guys look like you were ready to go back into battle recently. Obviously, you're always in battle. SBG Charleston is killing it. Adam Lobov is around the corner from war. But it looked like UFC yeah. 222 was going to get a last-minute dose of Conor McGregor and SBG. What exactly happened, and how close were you guys actually to come bring you this yeah. whole thing together? Yeah, so so I got the call off kind of almost uh, a little under a month out, just kind of out of the blue. Oh yeah, look, um, uh, Holloway's out of the fight. They're looking for a replacement uh, to fight Frankie, so I'm 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 up for it. I'm thinking of doing it. So I was like, well, this is all right. Let's see, let's see what the crack is. And um, went in and he sparred. Yeah, just he, he hasn't sparred in, in too hard in a while. So like. Went in and had a good top spar with one of the one of the guys similar to similar to uh, Frankie Soares, similar style and stuff like that. Went mm -hmm. in and looked looked amazing and we were like he's like, Yeah, he said, What do you think? I was like, You look fresh. We you know what to expect from Frankie Frankie, you're not gonna get anything um like he's he's the same type of fire the past, you know, all his career, you know, you know, the way the, the kind of style of fire he is. So I said, like, you, you know what you're gonna get with him. And uh, you looked great, so he's like, "Yeah, look, I'm gonna, I'm gonna reach out and see, if we, see what we can do." But um, uh, they got back the next day, uh, saying that um, it wasn't, it, the fight was gone, the fight was unavailable then. So mm. yeah, but he was up for it, and he was ready to go, and he was, you know, he's been training as well. Connor's been training the good bit, so he's, he, you know, he's got the bug again, which is, which is great. So uh, yeah, but unfortunately, that one didn't come to pass. And just quickly on that, do you, what, what was the weight situation for that? If that fight was going to happen, were you guys going to actually try and get down to featherweight, or were you looking for one sixty five? No, I, it would have been. It would have been. Yeah, it would have been. Have to. Would have had to be in a catch weight somewhere. You know, uh, featherweight. Uh, yeah, featherweight that close. So it wouldn't. It wouldn't have really happened. So you know, it had to be in kind of maybe lightweight or somewhere. Somewhere thereabouts. 
Did you did you hear about the idea of a one sixty five pound title? Was that ever sort of in in the discussions? Yeah, yeah there was there was there was talks about that as well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, there was talks about uh, maybe maybe doing it for for the, uh, the uh, new belts and stuff like that. But, wow. Who, who, um, whose, whose idea was yeah, that? Was like, that your guys throwing that I, out there, or was that the no, UFC I, pitching I, it? I, I don't know. I don't know who kind of just said like that they're, they're bringing in the new belt. Or they're, they're hoping to bring in the new belt, so we might we might push for that. I don't know whether they said it to him or or, or he was just saying about like there was there, that was in the air as well. So it it was it was crazy because you get a phone call and then you go in, you do your session, and it, like it's it, it was all just up in the air straight, straight off the bat, which is mm-hmm. great. You know, you, you, you go straight back into the madness, like, when it, with four weeks out. I think that would have been good as well, you know. Um, no big long build up to it, to a fight, just straight in, straight back into the cage. Uh, the fight had been on top of us, and, you know, but obviously, unfortunately, it didn't, didn't come to pass, but mm. who knows what's down the road. And yeah, just, absolutely. Just quickly, I mean, Brian Ortega, massive night, big win over Frankie Edgar. Yeah. What was your reaction to Ortega and sort of, I suppose, the position that he's built for himself in the division? A lot of people are really excited about a possible maybe Ortega-McGregor fight, maybe down the track one day if Ortega became champion. <laughs> yeah, like, uh, Ortega, you know, he's very, very good, very talented uh, guy. Um, you know, showcases his stand-up a little bit more. This one around has done, done really well. But I think we all know it's his, his, his ground game that, you know, kind of sets him apart from a lot of the guys. Um, he's, he's a very skilled uh, grappler. Um, yeah, he's, he's he brings a lot to the table like them all. Uh, you know, he, obviously him and Max is 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 um, is an interesting one as well. Um, I think obviously Max is a is a way more difficult fight than than Frankie. You know, uh, I think Ortega would would find it difficult one to to get him to the ground and then to, to beat him in the stand-up. So, but, you know, who knows? I mean, if, if Ortega gets a hold of that neck and, and, and drags him down to the ground, uh, you know, um, um, Max would be in a lot of trouble as well. So it, it's an interesting fight. He, he has a lot of tails, a lot, lot, lot of good skills. And uh, for him and Connor, yeah, uh, you know, I always say the same. No matter who Connor fights, yeah, he's just got to touch it on the, train and, uh, on the chin and, and they all go to sleep. But, <laughs> These are all. There's so many potential good fights for Conor. You know what I mean? He, you know, we're, we're, we're leading into into Habib and um, uh, and Ferguson. You know, selling enough as well, and that's going to be a big one as well. So there's there's a lot of lot of fights out there, and uh, I'm sure I'm sure anyone and everyone would like to get get Conor in the cage and 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 and, and do something big. You know. Yeah, I will, we'll touch on Tony and Khabib in just two seconds. But as someone you know in yourself yeah. who's been there from the very beginning, how different would you see that fight being in 2018 compared to the first one? Obviously, I'm talking about Max Holloway and Conor McGregor. And you know, a lot of people sort of gush over Max Holloway's improvements. Who do you think has made the most improvements yeah. in their overall game? Because they've both spent considerable considerable uh, time adding elements. Uh, yeah, no, I think I think both both fighters uh, are you know are twice. The, the the fight they were when they both fought. Um, I think Max, you know, Max has got more confidence in in his um, in his abilities, and uh, Connor, you know, Connor's just refined um, his, his techniques and stuff like that. Um, it would be a great fight. It'd be another great fight. But you know, what I, I think I, I think Connor would probably put Max away in the fight. I think Max would probably be way more way more confident in his ability and. You know, if you go in there a little bit overconfident with Conor, you, you're going to go to sleep. Um, where he was a little bit more, he stood back in the force fight. And, and, you know, I think that's... And obviously Conor injured himself. He couldn't put him away. But, um, yeah, I, I think, you know, I think it would be a great fight. Max is, Max is doing... He's done done so well since the Conor fight, you know. He's, he's been on a tear. Um, and even, like, the looks of John, John Kavanagh said it back in the day. He thought... Max would have been the next champion, um, you know. After that, after that fight with Con, you know, he he could see it in in Max, and I think everybody sees him. He's a he's a, he's a great fighter, but I, I still think Connor's another level compared to him mm. as well. Mm. 
I guess the interesting thing here is, Coach, that obviously Max is at featherweight. We know that it kind of looked like Conor McGregor wasn't that keen on going back down to featherweight. And here we are, you know, UFC 223 around the corner in the lightweight title between Tony and Khabib also on the line yeah. there. Are you saying that there's a good chance that Conor McGregor would actually go back down to featherweight, especially with an option to stay at lightweight? And what would be his motivators to do that? Because yeah. we know the weight cut is kind of brutal on him. Yeah, I mean, well, yeah, it is brutal on him, but so, uh, so are any of the cuts, you know, he, but he makes it, you know what I mean? He makes it every time. Yeah, he makes it every time. So, like, um, a featherweight fight, but I know, I, I thought I heard Max thinking of moving up as well, like, so, who knows, but the thing is with Conor, I suppose, it's, it's, it's what makes the most sense, what's the biggest draw, and, you know, that's still yet to be kind of out, you know whether it's whether it's another fight with Max. If 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 that was the biggest fight, and Conor would make the weight. Conor Conor's a professional. He would do what it takes to 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 um to get back down to featherweight. If it's a lightweight fight, you know he'll do what he wants. He needs to do to get to lightweight. He'll do whatever it takes to 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 um to to do the fight that makes the most sense. Um so. You know, if, I don't think I don't think Featherway is. I you know he hasn't he he hasn't made it, but that's because there was no need to. But you know, Max being on the tear that he's been on, um, you know that could be that could be a fight. You know, I can't speak for Conor. I I don't know what kind of um what fight he wants. But you know, let's see after after Figs and Habib. Let's see the the the, the reaction to 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 win that fight and uh and take it from there. I suppose. Mm-hmm. I gotta say, hats off to you because um, not only do you do the Owen Roddy vlogs, but you pump out an incredible amount of techniques of the week, um, and and you you know you yeah. break down fight finishes and things like that, and you actually uh, you're doing fan requests as well. And you did an excellent one on takedown defense that people really need to check out. Right. And one of the, one of the things that has always obviously been a big discussion point, especially now with Khabib Nurmagomedov dominating lightweight. You mentioned it's fighting Tony, and that's been obviously kind of takedown defense how they match up from your perspective as a coach, Owen. You know what would you say say is the key to Connor's takedown defense that you've sort of worked on with him over the years that you've noticed and what is it that maybe people don't quite understand or just seem to underestimate about it because we always hear that you know if, if he him and Khabib fought you know Khabib would dominate him etc cetera, etc cetera. What, what do you think people might be missing about Connor's takedown defense? Yeah I, I, I don't I don't I don't think people realize how good Connor's takedown defense is and um, Connor's been refining it for, for many years and like he, he's obviously doing this, a lot of stuff with John and and Sergey Bukowski, the the um the wrestling coach at SPG as well. Connor's worked many many years with him as well, so Connor's well versed in in wrestling. Um, and it, it, it's his ability to 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 stop stop things early. You know, he, he never allows he never allows stuff uh, to to get too deep. Like he mm. never allows people to get you know. You know, right in on the takedown. He's always he's always establishing his frames and stuff like that. Uh, and and even you know, he even stops him before people even get there. It's his, his ability to to maintain the range and keep people at his arm's length. These are these are all big factors that that make it very difficult for for, for wrestlers to to get in deep and to enter in you know correctly into a good position to take him down. Even mm-hmm. against the cage, like you've seen him against the uh, you know. Uh, Alvarez, like uh, his ability to, to, you know, to, to get the frames in and and and, and stuff to take down was amazing in that for you. Mm. And you know, he's 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 well versed. I mean, people don't realize people, you know, people can say what they want, but you know, we see it day in and day out in the gym. He's he's very very difficult to take down. Mm. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, and just a couple more questions and we'll let you go. Just quickly on that fight, who do you think wins between Tony and Khabib? And if you had to choose. Mm. Who who you'd rather see Connor fight next out of those guys? Who excites you more? Yeah, um, it depends. On who excites me? It depends. Both them, both them bring a lot, like bring a lot to the table. Now, obviously, they don't, they don't bring the same kind of magnitude of what Connor brings, but they both, like you know, stylistically, they both pose different threats. Like Ferguson is, um, he's very unorthodox and he he he, he throws things out of nowhere. You know what I mean? Habib comes forward, tries to walk you down, um, tries to make you panic and take a step backwards and and and, and put you on the cage and then just grinds it out. So they're, they're both um, 
that both you know they're both great fighters to try and break down and and uh, are both great fighters to try and break down and uh, and come up with a game plan to beat them. Um, who do I think wins against each uh, when when they compete? Um, I I'd probably go against uh, I'd probably go with Habib just just because I'm yet to see people stop stop him from from uh, pressing him up against the cage and and, and taking him down and, and, and putting the weight on. Um, but then again, you never know. He, he, Ferguson comes out with these, you know, he's got that lovely, he's head and arm chokes and darses and stuff like that. He's He's got serious submissions himself and he'll definitely be beating Habib in the striking exchanges, you know. He, he's got an orthodox strikes as well. So And, and Habib, we've all seen that he, he's been hit a few times. So it's an interesting fight, but I would probably go with Habib, to be honest. All right, well, there you go, Khabib. Just quickly before we let you go, Dana White, obviously, usually very respectful when talking about Conor. He basically said that Conor does want the belt. He wants to be the champion, but he doesn't want to defend it. You know, these days, it's probably one of the biggest criticism that Conor faces. What do you think of that notion of sort of Conor not defending the belts? And do you think in some ways, you know, Conor being stripped of the belt when Tony and Khabib fight, it somewhat, I guess, works out well for him? Because like you said, there's a lot of options for Conor, and this way he can pursue, you know, mm-hmm. other big fights. Yeah, to be honest, like, yeah, I, I just, you know, Conor likes to fight the right fight. He wants to fight the, the fight that makes the most sense, um, you know. And and at the at the moment, like, you know, he didn't he didn't get to defend his, his featherweight belt because there was at the time there was nobody there for him to to fight against. There there just wasn't the opponent there. Do you know what I mean? So and unfortunately, that that's why he had to give it up. Like you know what I mean? And and that's that's the case. That's been the case uh, at um, uh, uh, lightweight as well. There wasn't the name to fight. You know, at the end of the day, Connor's he's a superstar now, and you know he deserves you know the big 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 paychecks that he you know that he he um, that he got in his, obviously in his last box. But he deserves these big paychecks. And you know there hasn't been there hasn't been a big name in the in the UFC to to, to match him. But you know, yeah, as I said, whoever whoever kicks up the biggest force and 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 gets the biggest um, you know biggest uh, I suppose kind of fan base behind them, he'll fight. And whether whether it's whether it's again to, whether it's a featherweight, whether it's a lightweight, or whether it's a different way, you know, whatever the biggest fight is. I'm sure that's the fight Conor will take because that's what he's about. It's not he's not afraid to defend any belt. He's not a, he's not afraid to fight anybody. Mm. But he wants to fight the biggest fights possible. You know, he's the biggest name in the sport and he wants he wants the biggest fights that he can possibly do, you know what I mean? Mm, I think that's what people love him. Of course. And I mean while we're talking about big names, I mean and speaking of one sixty five, would you like to see a Conor McGregor GSP fight at one sixty five possibly for the belt? Because there are some rumors around that and we know there's no one bigger than GSP in the company. Yeah, well, that is Connor. <laughs> <laughs> wow. but, um, course, like yeah. you know what I mean? Uh like yeah, like that would be that would be that would be a big pay per view without a deal. You know what I mean? I, I still say that Connor brings most like I think I've seen something um, about uh, Faraz going up like that. Let's see who's the, the biggest pay per view draw. I, I'm, I'm, I'd be I'd be confident in saying that Connor is still the, the biggest pay per view draw between yeah. him and DSP. But it would be it would be a, an insane fight. It would be a crazy fight. It would be it would be huge. Um, it would be probably the biggest fight that they've that the UFC have done. But um, yeah, and it would be great. And I, you know, if I'm sure uh, if if the money was right for 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 Connor and, and, and obviously um George that that would be amazing as well. For the one sixty four belt it it would be a, it would be an insane story. So who knows, like you know what I mean? I, I, I always say I think whatever the fans kick up for the most, like and whatever the fans rally behind, that's what fight will happen. Do you know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. that's been the case always. When the fans, you know, come out on the and um and their millions and they they all start kicking up and they get on Instagram, they get on Twitter and they start calling for these this big fight, whatever it may be. That's that's what will make the most sense, you know what I mean? 
Well, there you go, guys. It's up to the fans. Owen, we could literally sit here and talk to you all day. We have so much more to ask you, but you've been very generous, very kind with your time, and I feel like we've been a bit greedy, so we'll let you go. Guys, don't forget to follow the man on Twitter and Instagram, at Coach Owen Roddy. Of course, subscribe to the YouTube channel, Coach Owen Roddy. A lot of vlogs, a lot of techniques. Send him your requests, because he is doing requests for the techniques, and uh, we hope to see you in Australia one of these days, Owen. Obviously, there's a lot of hungry martial artists wanting to learn from <laughs> you yourself. We already got Coach Kavanagh. I think it's time for Owen Roddy to come. Yeah. Down, maybe do some seminars and teach the technique of the week in real life. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, maybe if that's the case, if I could get over, I would. Um, look, look, guys, appreciate it. I hope it's, uh, I hope you're all good, and I'll leave you still. Cheers. Well, there he is, Owen Roddy. And I mean, it would be great to see him come down to Australia, Cass. Uh, we did the whole thing with John Cavanagh down here. It would be great to pick Owen Roddy's brain mm. down here. I know a lot, a lot of really passionate fans in Australia and New Zealand would love to hear from him. And the good thing about Owen is it's not an act. He's actually a super nice guy in person. Um, I, I actually chat to him on Facebook Messenger. The guy is super busy but still takes the time out to come on our program, even though he's literally a massive star over there in Ireland and has a lot going on. And we, we record our interviews late at night as well, so that must be super tough for him too mm. after a big day at work. And he, he always takes the time, is always a classy guy. And, is just is just a really really big pleasure to be around. Last so guys, time we had him on the show, it was I think part two of his wife's birthday, and he had a massive massive night the night before. So yes. we were a little bit nervous that he wasn't going to pick up. And true to form, he he was a trooper. He picked up, and um, you could you could you could hear it. You could hear that he had a massive night. So what a gun for you know doing that interview last time and this and time. And people need to check out his uh, you know, some of his previous fights because he was legitimately a very, very high-level fighter in his day and a lot of great fights, a lot of great wins. And I think you can check that out on YouTube. So go on there, check it out. And also, of course, check out his YouTube channel because I love how this guy brings a different perspective to what's going on behind the scenes with the camp as well whenever Conor McGregor fights, whenever any, any one of them fight, mm. especially with these techniques taking requests from fans. I mean, where was this? When we were young and growing up and looking for these kinds of things, I mean, I kind of feel like Rich Franklin talking about learning Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu <laughs> off a VHS tape, but literally, yeah. when I was beginning uh, my Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu sort of career, I, they, were, they were selling apps for like 80 bucks. They would rip you off and give you these terrible techniques that had nothing Jesus. to do with anything. So, I mean, and I knew people that, I was always too broke, but I knew people that were buying them. And now you got Owen doing this kind of thing. It's unbelievable. Make sure to check it out. But a couple of quick takeaways from that, Casper, to me. Very interested to see what happens with Conor McGregor next. I was very fascinated when Owen was talking about the fact that legitimately they were looking to get into this UFC 222 uh, fight with Frankie Edgar. I mean, on short notice, and even though it was a catch weight, it still it still blows my mind to see that legitimately Conor McGregor wants to get back in there. It looks like money is not really the big drawing point anymore. It just seems like he's got the itch to kind of get back in that octagon. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's sort of a little from column A from column B. I think that Conor McGregor wants to get in there, but I think he also knows his worth. And I think, you know, the UFC were talking about, uh, well, I think I think it was Artem Lobov was saying that they, the UFC told him there wasn't enough time to promote the fight and build it properly. I think there's some truth to that. Uh, I, I had a look at, you know, when the fight announcements were for Conor's previous fights, as opposed to, you know, when he fought and how close they were. And I think they were all at least like a month and a half, two months in advance. You know, even the, the, the Mayweather fight, which came together relatively quickly in the last second, I think there was at least a month and a half or two month build up for that. So I can sort of understand that from the UFC's perspective, but I, I have no doubt there was also a case of, hey, I'll, I'll fight, you know, but for for this amount of money and maybe the UFC just decided, you know what, we're, we're not going to generate that kind of money or we don't want to meet those kinds of demands. One of the interesting things that I took away was that Owen said that they want to bring in a new title, a, UFC, a, a 165-pound title. And so we thought, oh, you know, maybe we'll jump on that. I I wonder sort of, you know, how much truth that to that there is or how much of it is sort of Chinese whispers. Are they really bringing in a new division? And if it is, is it really going to be 165 pounds? Because that'd be pretty crazy. There's obviously the discussions of, you know, maybe Conor McGregor and GSP fighting at, you know, 165 pounds doing a catchweight fight. Obviously, that's a fight that's been teased and built for, you know, a, a long, long time. I'm sure everybody would, you know, I, I'm sure it would draw hugely and it, it'd be an interesting fight in its own right. I, I, I struggle to see how that would be a great idea, though, to put it for a title. I think if Conor McGregor and GSP fight, you know, Conor's the biggest draw in MMA. GSP is arguably the second. I don't think a belt is really going to change anything. I don't think you need belts. And I think what worse way to kick off a division than to have two guys fight and realistically, 
are probably not going to follow up and defend that belt. Like, what if Conor McGregor wants to fight Khabib or Tony afterwards? Why would he want to tie himself down, you know, with a belt? GSP, he seems like he's kind of doing his own thing. What if he fight, wants to fight Askren or, or Woodley or somebody else? So I think that'd be a bit bizarre if they really wanted to kick off the division by, you know, having those guys fighting for the inaugural title. Um, I, I think I think the only good side of there is at least you'd have two guys that are, you know, worthy of that champion label as opposed to, say, you know, picking two random guys out of nowhere and saying, you know what, you guys are going to fight for the belt. What, what do you think, Dennis? Yeah, it's interesting. And I'm interested about the UFC kind of even thinking about bringing in this new division because – a 165 division, like a lot of these jumps, people don't realize a lot of these jumps from, uh, you know, lightweight to welterweight to middleweight to light heavyweight. There's definitely opportunities in, in some of the in, in some of these gaps to have a division because some of these fighters aren't really fighting at their optimum weight. So I'm interested. I'm, I'm kind of fascinated with the fact that they're in the back of their mind, they're kind of looking at this division. And I wonder how long they've actually been looking at bringing in a new division. And I'm wondering if this whole Chris Cyborg uh, featherweight thing is kind of getting them. And also the whole flyweight thing in the women's divisions are kind of giving them more, I suppose, confidence and bringing in more divisions in the future. I know Dana White wasn't too keen on bringing yeah. in divisions initially. So I'm interested to happen, what happens with that. But, yeah, I agree with you. If you crown a champion that never defends his belt, that's definitely going to, I suppose, create some issues. And just, also, yeah. I was, I was also, say, uh, Sorry, just, just on, on 165. If they do 165, what happens with 170? Because it's hard to imagine there's going to be two divisions separated by five pounds. Do they keep it at 170? Do they change it to 175? And then you have 155, 165, 175, and then 185, and then you've got those, you know, 10-pound mm. jumps, which I think would make a lot more sense. But then what happens to, the, you know, the whole, I guess, history of the, of the you know, 170 division, the welterweight division as we know it? Because you're right, like, Diego Sanchez is, you know, publicly campaigning and begging for them to do this fight because he says that, you know, the UFC needs a 165-pound division. Kevin Lee has been open open about it. There's a lot of guys that have been open. And I, I think that if you're going to split any divisions, like if you were going to do that, let's say light heavyweight and heavyweight, it'd be terrible because they're both really, really thin divisions. And if you wanted to thin them out by doing, say, like a cruiserweight division in the middle, that'd be a terrible idea. I think, I think if any divisions could possibly handle it, it will be welterweight and lightweight because they're already so stacked. But, um... I don't know, man. I'm I'm curious to see what what happens there. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to interesting to see what happens there. But there it is, guys. Another episode of Submission Radio in the books. Just quickly, Casper, I did watch the new Death Wish movie. There's a new Death Wish movie, everybody. It's actually out. Not that many people knew about it, but Bruce Willis is actually playing the main dude's role in this movie. And so it's a uh, new it, movie, or they've or they've just remastered the old one. It's a new movie. Oh. It's completely new. It's actually out. People don't really know about it because it does have a very juicy 16% rating <laughs> on Rotten Tomatoes. Wow. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anyone else that's really good in this movie. Um, Bruce Willis. Um, no, not really. And um, But, I, I, you know what? I'm a big fan of Death Wish. I like it. And if, when anytime anyone builds a sort of an arc for me where someone's family gets absolutely destroyed and then they come back to get them, like Liam Neeson is an example of that, I'm, I'm always interested because I want to see the payoff. I want to see the juicy payoff. And Eli Roth actually directed it, which is a pretty crazy thing because it, this movie is so under wraps. People don't really even realize that it's out here in Australia. So I checked it out and I'm here to report that the movie was not the, not the best movie. But <laughs> the good thing about it is you do get a good level of gore. You do get a good level of revenge and payback. And mm -hmm. um, the problem with Bruce Willis as of late, and I know a lot of people know about the fact that he, there's a lot of stuff going around about the fact that he's a very, very difficult guy to work with. There's some stories going around about him being on Expendables and a lot of the other stuff. He was difficult when demands. he tried to get him on the show. So yeah. Difficult when he, when he tried to get him on the show. <laughs> so he is a guy. And also, and a lot of it is straight to DVD movies. He kind of just plays the same character, doesn't really go out of the box too much. In this movie, I'll tell you what, Bruce Willis put in a decent job. He, he, he was all right. He was a little bit different to what he is usually. Um, they, they tried their best to put it together. It, it is obviously predictable. People saw the first movie. Everybody knows how it goes. But if you want to go in there, see a dude come out and sort of get his revenge, sort of an average Joe kind of guy and ignore the fact that it's Bruce Willis. And if you want to sort of see a bit of gore and see that Eli Roth effect, if you want to watch a movie that it's not going to be three billboards or something that you have to overthink too much, it's not the shape of water, I'll tell you right now. There's no deaf girl falling in love with the weird alien lizard yes. thing. Then this might be the movie for you. So 
do you go watch it in the cinemas or not? Definitely don't go watch it in the cinemas. Save your money. But wait till it comes out possibly on a Netflix or something like that. Watch it at home with some friends over some popcorn, a couple of beers, maybe a couple of pizzas. Something that you you and me might do, Casper, with our friends when we do things like watch The Room. If you want to watch some gore, some brains exploding, wow. check it out. Timothy Johnson rating. How about this? First, Ooh. Timothy Johnson mustache rating. I wanted to include one for the second episode because I've done one in a while. Um, we'll give it. I'll be generous. I'll give it two, two, two mustaches out of five. It, it's, it's fun to watch. Don't crucify me, Christian, our videographer, who does weekly polls on movies on his personal <laughs> Facebook page. Don't crucify me, okay? I know I'm going to get a text message soon crucifying me over it. But, yeah, check it out if you want a bit of fun. Um, I, 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 from- didn't, I didn't watch the movie, but I want to give it a mustache rating as well. So I'll give you a mustache rating on your mustache rating, on your entire movie review. I'll give you four mustaches out of that, which is pretty, that's which is pretty, that's pretty high. I'm a pretty harsh critic. I think that's yeah, it's true. Good. And plus, like, we weren't planning on doing this review, so no. it came out of nowhere. So I will take that on board. And uh, the other thing I was going to say is, I'm looking forward to another crappy movie that's going to be coming out soon with John Cena called Blockers, Cock Blockers, where they play parents uh, trying to stop their daughter yeah. from have a se- having a sex pact. I like uh, the guy that plays the other father. I, is it a Judd Uptown movie? It might be. I'm going to, I'm going to, we'll do a mustache rating on that as well. But in the movie front, I mean, uh, oh, this is quickly, quickly. We'll finish this up on this because running out of time and stuff like that. I will say this, <laughs> and this is going to be another controversial thing. This might be the most controversial thing that happens the whole episode, but I feel bad if I don't say it because you know us on Submission Radio, we speak our thoughts and whatever happens afterwards happens. Fuck the cunts, as you said on James Lynch's podcast. Fuck the cunts. <laughs> Black Panther is not the best superhero of all time. Movie of all time. There, I said it. Crucify me all you want. It's not the best superhero movie of all time. I know a lot of people are big on it. They say it's it's the best. It's 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 unbelievable. I know people are watching it three or four times. I like what it's done for the movie industry. Kendrick Lamar put out an amazing album soundtrack, and I like the fact that soundtracks are coming back. By the way, and people are really putting thought into their soundtracks because me and Cass were big on soundtracks back in the day. But for me, this movie definitely not the best. And when I'm talking about the best, it's not even cracking my top five, guys. Wow. I'll be honest right there. It's not in my top five. Do I think it was a fun movie? Yeah, sure. Did Michael B. Jordan do a good job? Sure. You know, was the whole thing. Was it a bit different to what they usually do? Sure. But it, and this isn't a criticism on the movie per se, but the fact that there are so many amazing uh, Marvel movies out there. And my Timothy Johnson mustache rating? I'm only going to give it three out of five. How about that? So maybe we That's should finish good. the show. Oh, no. It's pretty good. Do you, but, you, know, do, you, do you have a favorite Marvel movie? I, I, like, I'm catching off guard here, but if, if, if you're saying that's not your favorite, is there one that stands out above the rest? Is there one that's sort of in there in the heart, hearts of hearts? Yeah, well, it's very difficult for me because the movies that I do like are movies that uh, many people don't. But, I mean, it's hard. It's, Just some Marvel ones. N- notable mentions would be... I appreciated Doctor Strange and the fact that they went all zany on it. It was mm. crazy effects as he, as he flies between universes. I'm a big fan of Thor Ragnarok, which is, uh, for a lot of people, a blasphemy on Thor because they kind of, um, the, the director sort of took it into more of a comedy route. Uh, I'm a big fan of Guardians of the Galaxy. I even like the second one. and I love the soundtrack and the way the retro soundtrack brought out sort of a different part of a story arc in those movies. I'm a big mm. fan of the second and uh, third Captain America. I actually believe the third Captain America was a better Avengers movie than most of the Avengers movies. So there it is there. I'm a bit critical in the new Spider-Man movie. I thought it was fun, but do I think it's the best movie? I don't. And uh, also quite critical of the Iron Man movies. I like the first ones. I, th- I thought the second one was kind of rubbish. And I thought, th- I thought the- while the third one was well done, it was it kind of missed the point for me. It, it wasn't yeah. really a superhero movie. It was more a story of a, a broken man. And, um, and that's where my criticisms come for, uh, you know, The Dark Knight Rises as well, a movie that I enjoyed, but also more of a story of a broken man so we could talk about this oh, for ages but Dark Rise. just just quickly i'll give my two cents you know what marvel movie is probably one of my favorites i don't know if i'd say officially favorite but it's like mm. a really it, we're going back now we're going back years and years and years and it's old school i really hope it's marvel otherwise I'll, I'll have a lot of egg on my face but i would say blade i would say the first blade um i really love that movie and uh yeah i, th- I think it's kind of underrated as far as the marvel movie goes and I, for, for me it's an all-time classic i guess seeing as a kid it uh it's sort of I don't know. Has that special thing for me? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think Blade was the first Blade was amazing. And the thing about that first Blade is, if you go back to the time and place when it was put together and the concept that they had, the fact they were able to pull it off was is an amazing thing. The way that they did, and it still stands the test of time. You can still yeah. watch it now. And it's kind of, and this is why. And see, we're off on a tangent now, and I can't stop myself before I say this. <laughs> this is why the 1989 Batman is such a good movie. 
Because you go, all right, this movie, it's a bit ridiculous. The fight scenes are a bit off, blah, blah, blah. But it was it's from 1989. The Put year something we were born. else on. Yeah, the year the year I was born. Put something else on the TV. A movie from ninety. I mean, there's a few out there that are, that are good, but the majority of the stuff you struggle to watch. And the fact that they were able to do what they did with the costume and, and so the eerie look. The fact that that Batmobile was such a good Batmobile from 1989. <laughs> I mean, Jack Nicholson. Sure, was he Heath Ledger when he played the Joker? No, but there were aspects to his performance that are still good to this day. So. That's a good movie. That's a side thing. But yeah, give us your thoughts on that. You know, with Black Panther not being uh, in, the, in the top of my movie list, crucify me in the comment section below. I guess that's it, Casper. We're back for another episode of Submission Radio. It was great to have all the big guests. A big thank you to all our guests. And we'll catch you guys next week for another episode of Submission Radio.